This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello, welcome to CGTN. This is our special coverage on the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. Live from Beijing, I'm Pan Deng. And I'm Li Dongning. Well, this seven-day event is uh, rather significant, not only for China, but also for the whole world. It draws the roadmap for China's development in the years to come, a trajectory that can also impact China's relations with the international community. Some 2,300 delegates to this Congress, representing over 96 million members of the Communist Party of China from all walks of life, are ready for the opening session, which would take place in about two hours at 10 o'clock a.m. Beijing time on Sunday. Right, and the 20th CPC National Congress will review the work of the uh, past five years and also chart China's future course. Since the 19th CPC National Congress in 2017, the party has successfully led the people in achieving the historic mission of building a moderately prosperous society, a goal that was reached on the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China. And uh, together with the uh, Chinese people, the CPC now works towards the next goal of building a modern socialist country. On this very day, we bring you to the Great Hall of the People in Beijing for the opening session of the 20th CPC National Congress. We also bring you live to the Delegates Corridor, where party delegates will meet the press. So you can also log on to CGTN's social media platforms where the events will be live streamed. So join us for this historical congress and also this new journey. So the agenda of the 20th CPC National Congress has been set. It was approved during a preparatory meeting and presidium of the 20th CPC National Congress, which also decided the date of the congress from October the 16th to the 22nd. According to the agenda, delegates are expected to hear and examine a report of the 19th CPC Central Committee, examine a work report of the 19th CPC Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, deliberate and adopt an amendment to the CPC Constitution, and elect the 20th CPC Central Committee and the 20th CPC Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. A lot to anticipate indeed. And for more, our reporter Dong Xue is joining us from the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. So Dong Xue, everything and everyone is ready. What's the atmosphere like over there? Well, good morning, Donnie. Yes, in about two hours, over 2,200 delegates of China's ruling Communist Party will be in Beijing's Great Hall of the People right behind me for its 20th National Party Congress. Well, before the event's opening ceremony, about 20 of the delegates will meet with the press at what's known as the uh, Delegates Corridor, which can be described as a more orderly form of a press stakeout. Well, as we've been told, the Congress will last a week, ending exactly seven days from now on October 22nd and all the preparations are complete according to the press briefings yesterday while well, party delegates of this year's uh, Congress were elected this July representing over 96 million CPC members well, they come from all walks of life such as village party secretaries you know social workers and those come from you know sectors like science and technology, national defense and law, and many others who've made great contributions in their own industries as well as to the country. And they've already had their work put out for them. Well, because over the uh, coming days, these are the five main things on the agenda. You know, first, the delegates will hear and examine the work report of the preceding 19th Central Committee. Second, they will examine the work report of the 19th Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. Third, they will deliberate and adopt an amendment to the CPC's constitution. Fourth is electing the 20th CPC Central Committee and lastly electing the next Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. Well, one uh, agenda items that has been, you know, closely watched here and abroad is the uh, party constitutional amendment. At a press conference yesterday, we've learned that the revision will enshrine 
theories and practices on national governance that have been set forth since the 19th Congress. Well, actually, well, since its introduction, the CPC's constitution has been amended about 10 times. The CPC constitution is the highest binding document for the party because it offers a view of China's future, reflecting you know major changes to leadership and governance. So all eyes are on how the key document will be updated in the coming days. And also issues tackle of both domestic and international concerns, uh, such as you know China's anti-corruption campaign, poverty alleviation, and the relations with the, the United States, as well as how China will contribute to the global governance will all be closely monitored during the session. Dong Ning. Right. Rather comprehensive agenda, a lot of work for the delegates seen. Thank you very much. Dong Xue reporting from the Great Hall of the People. Now let's cross live to our reporter Dai Kai. He's at the Delegates Corridor where members of the party will meet the press. Hello Kai, uh, what can we expect from this occasion? Yes, Pandeng, right behind me is the Delegates Corridor. This is where journalists can hear from the delegates directly and ask them questions face to face. Well, for all the delegates showing up here today, uh, this, uh, this is kind of their red carpet show. So they come from all parts of China and they are from all walks of life. Pretty much in tune with what the spokesperson of the 20th CPC National Congress said at Saturday's press conference that the delegates are broadly representative. Uh, the professions range from emergency rescue team members to uh, athletes, even taikonauts. So the list goes on and on and you can tell that there's definitely a good mix of delegates from just about any sector you can think of. Well, what they have in common here, however, what they all share are roles of China's progress over the past years. For example, uh, some of the delegates were chosen uh, to be here today because of their contributions on poverty alleviation and rural revitalization. China eradicated absolute poverty uh, nationwide in the year of 2022, lifting some 800 million people uh, out of poverty in the past 40 years. So that is regarded by many experts as a miracle in world economic history. And how did it happen? Well, uh, some, may, some might say uh, there were many contributing factors, but you can't deny that those who led the change in underdeveloped counties and remote villages were a big part of it. So again, each and every delegate showing up here today, uh, they kind of kind of can be seen as a microcosm of what China has achieved in uh, fields they represent over the past years. And uh, so again, the uh, message officials are trying to send here by setting up a corridor like this is clear that the Communist Party of China is committed to openness and transparency as practices like this uh, help media outlets both domestic and overseas better make better sense of what is happening and the priorities of the country's ruling party going forward. Back to you, Pandem. Thank you very much, our reporter Dai Kai in the Great Hall of the People. Now, for more insights into this crucial occasion, we're joined in the studio by Mr. Wang Hui Yao and Mr. Victor Gao. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, this upcoming 20th CPC National Congress is in both domestic and global focus. Mr. Gao, how would you interpret the importance of this gathering? Well, first of all, this 20th Party Congress indeed is uh, the most important political event in China every five years and in this particular case uh, over the past 10 years. And it is important also in looking forward in the next coming five years and beyond. And this will touch all walks of life because the about 2,300 delegates are really from all walks of life. They include incumbent leaders, at the very top, uh, former leaders at the very top, but also uh, party activists and uh, outstanding party members from the lowest level of the hierarchy and the structure of the CPC. And they are generally considered as representatives, outstanding members of the CPC and also outstanding citizens of China. When they gather together under the same roof, talk about all that has been done over the past five years and project into the future, really they will uh, touch upon all the major decisions to be made and decide what's the overall direction for the party and for China as a whole going forward. 
Right, and um, Mr. Wang, while the curtain is about to be raised on the 20th National uh, Party Congress, with a lot of expectations from both China and abroad as well, what are your main expectations on the big event? Yes, uh, thank you, Dong Ling. I, I think this is a highly watched, uh, uh, not domestic, but globally uh, event. I, as Victor mentioned, it's the historical event that held by CBC every five years. So I think this, uh, this great event, uh, you know, we had a very good representation, but then I think that we're going to expect a lot of uh, a summary of achievement in the past uh, five years, and of course looking beyond uh, in the next five years. But most important, we have, uh, of course, uh, newly elected uh, CPC uh, Central Committee members, we're going to have a new uh, uh, in the Central Committee, and then we're going to have a new Standing Committee, of course we're going to have a new cohort of the uh, leaders uh, coming to the to the to the party, so so that's really important, and it's going to impact not only for China but for the world because China now is uh, so much intertwined with the world, and mm. uh, the the policy, the, uh, the you know the the objective set, mm. and also the, the the rally, the spirit of of the of the nation, it's all you know well uh, <laughs> displayed at this mm. conf conference. As an so, international expert, what are your personal expectations? What do you want to see from this congress? Well, I think we'd like to see, because this is highly watched internationally, we'd like to, you know, I think inject the confidence to the, uh, to, to, to the world, you know, also uh, to really let people know China has such a, a great uh, uh, plan and also to not only helping China but to the world. China wants to uh, continue to be open and also reform and also, of course, uh, wants to be more working with other countries, you know, will be internationally more active, but also uh, for the developing countries. So, so you can see probably all the China's agenda will continue, like the Belt and Road Initiative, Global uh, Development Initiative, Global Security Initiative, will all be uh, discussed and probably further enhanced to really, uh, you know, meet expectation of the world, but also seeking peace and prosperity and see a stabilized world economy will be also discussed, I think, in this conference. Uh, well, Mr. Gao, earlier you just uh, mentioned the hierarchy and also the diversity for those uh, party delegates attending this national uh, congress. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, their rights and obligations and how does that reflect um, the function, the, the daily functioning of uh, the CPC as the world's largest political party? Indeed, the CPC is the largest political party in the world. Its membership runs all the way almost to 100 million people, larger than the total population of Germany. And no political party or no political force anywhere in the world is as powerful and as serving the people as the CPC in China. In that sense, it's a very, very ex Intensive and it really penetrates to all walks of life and all corners of China. However, it is structured in such a coherent way that it has, for example, at the very top the Central Committee, which includes the Politburo and the Standing Committee of the Politburo, but then in provinces, municipalities, autonomous regions, and in all government entities and all state owned enterprises, and increasingly in private owned enterprises, there are uh, party committees or party branches and each party branch or committee is really a very lively and dynamic entity in itself. It really gathers all the information relevant to the party committee and then it uh, reports upward to the Central Committee all the relevant things so that eventually the decision made by the Central Committee is very re reflective of all the facts on the ground. And then, once a decision is made by the Central Committee, it is very much carried forward by the party branches, the party committees everywhere in China. So it is a very powerful force in terms of uh, deliberation on the one hand, but also execution. Efficiency has always been the very important factor for the CPC leadership. And it is this kind of efficiency that has led to great transformation of China economically, but also in terms of China's standing on the global stage. Mm -hmm. So that's more about uh, structure-wise. Uh, what about delegates? Uh, how would you... Uh, interpret their obligations and, uh, and rights this time? Indeed, the delegates are all uh, elected and 
I think uh, in places other than uh, Xinjiang and Tibet, as reported yesterday, in all other places, the elected members actually are smaller than the proposed candidates. Mm. So this is very important. This is truly democracy with Chinese characteristics within the CPC. Unlike many Western reports, CPC is very dynamic and very competitive inside its ranks and files. And this is mainly the driving force why CPC has never been complacent. CPC always adapts itself to the changing circumstances and each delegate is fully authorized. Indeed, since we're talking about delegates, let's cross live to right. the Great Hall of the People where the delegate of to the 20th CPC National Congress and now entering the Great Hall of the People. 欢迎大家来到中国共产党第二十次全国代表大会 20th CPC National Congress and this is the first interview with the delegates and with the CCTV and Wang Yan and it's my great honor to be the moderator of today's session and uh, Mr. Jai Zhongwei will be asking the friend from the press to ask your questions Today we are very honored to have with us many delegates from all walks of life. And please identify your affiliations before raising the question and to whom the question is addressed. And please be brief and in, in the interest of time. So we have the first group of delegates with us now. We see some familiar faces, and please give a self-introduction to yourselves. So, Mr. Zhu Youyong. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhu Youyong. I am assigned by the CAE to uh, Lantang County of Yunnan Province as a technological specialist. And the Lantan County is at the west, uh, the um, southwest region of China, and used to be a poverty-stricken areas. And since 2014, uh, 2015, I became part of this poverty alleviation effort, and I work in the different fields, and they these fields are actually my labs. I help them to raise potatoes and uh, Chinese traditional medicines. And we also open up training courses to teach the farmers of the new technologies. Hello, everyone. I am Wang Yaping. Today is October the 16th, a very special day for me. Last year on the same day, I and my teammates were setting off to the universe and uh, today I'm very excited to be part of this um, 20th National Congress and I look forward to this great Congress. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Wu Daqing. The April this year, uh, the General Secretary granted us with the medals, and today, as a party delegate, it's my honor to join today's conference. Uh, today's um, conference. Thank you. Now the floor is open to questions. First reporter is with CMG. Thank you. With the uh, CMG, my question goes to Ms. Wang Yaping. You are the first person to teach a course from the space station and also the first female uh, female title not uh, takes a spacewalk. And can you share, us, share with us some of uh, your personal feelings and your expectations for China's future? Um, space exploration. As is known to all, 
Three of my teammates are now on duty. And each time we heard this great news of uh, the party and the country, it was great inspiration to us. I stepped in my first journey in 2013, and in the past 10 years, we have made major achievement in terms of uh, the um, time of uh, space missions. When the Shenzhou 5 was first launched, it was my was that time that my dream has been ignited. And but at that time, I've never dreamed that I could teach a course to the kids from space. Right now, the first batch of students who listened to my courses have already become my teammates. I believe that this, my feeling is first, is this pa great power of our times and also the power of inheritance. And you asked me about it, uh, the expectations. We believe that uh, we are looking forward to more young people to join us. And China's space station will be fully completed, and we look forward to explore the universe with our foreign colleagues as well. Last but not least, I want to say that we ride our dreams to the universe and to the space, and we are always on the way. We are always ready to march on, to fly higher and fly farther, and to act according to our loyalty and duty to our party and people. Okay, next question. Thank you. With Renmin Daily. My question goes to Mr. Zhu Youyong. General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out that the, um, our scientific researchers should base your research on the ground of China and to focus on the application of the technological research. So can you tell us more about your practice in this regard? Thank you for the question. I'd like to give an example in terms of technological innovation. After the village that I am in was uh, get, got out of poverty, our grain has been shifted from coarse grain to rice, but we do not have uh, any rice paddy as well. Therefore, the rice is not self-sufficient. To address that problem, we have successfully res uh, did a research in terms of uh, planting rice on dry grounds. This is a major breakthrough in terms of uh, rice production. The first priority that we focus on is to select the best variety that can fit the uh, soil condition on dry grounds. And the second priority for us is to get rid of uh, the, the grass on the dry lands. This is another technology that we had developed. This rice on dry ground is highly applauded by local people, and uh, this year our yield reached uh, 788 kilograms per mu, and a total of a total of 500,000 mu have been developed, and we have realized self-sufficient that can feed all of the villages with our own production. So this kind of technology is our practice to act according to General Secretary Xi's instructions, and we will continue to forge ahead. Thank you. Next question. From Beijing Daily. 
Thank you. My question goes to Mr. Wu Dajing. Currently, we have uh, 300 million people that are enjoying winter sports. And as the ambassador to promote winter sports, what do you think we should do to encourage more people to join? Thank you. We have more than 300 million people that participated in winter sports. Ten years ago, there were only less than 100 ice, ice fields. Even professional athletes like me uh, would have difficulty finding an ice, ice field ten years ago. But currently, we have more than 1,500 um, ice fields. And also, in the past, all of my teammates are from the northeastern part of China, but currently we have teammates that have come, come from all parts of China. We now see that more people from the southern parts of China are enjoying winter sports, and some are from uh, the desert area. And uh, I also saw in a ice field in uh, Mianyang of Sichuan province, uh, I saw kids of uh, four or five years old uh, said hello to me, saying that uh, they fell in love with winter sports uh, after seeing our game, our competition. And uh, we believe that in the future, we will be seeing more talents emerge from these young kids, and more champions will also emerge. And as a professional athlete, I will con continue to fight for the honor for our country and also contribute to building China into a strong country in sports. And winter is coming, and I um, I want to invite all of you to join me in winter sports. Thank you. Thank you all. Now let's invite the second group of uh, delegates. Welcome. Self-introduction. Delegate Jiang Lijuan, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Jiang Lijuan. I am the Secretary of Party Branch of Xiajiang Village, Chen and County Zhejiang Province. General Secretary Xi Jinping used to have a contact point in Xiajiang Village when he was working in Zhejiang. So before today, my villagers asked me to report to General Secretary about the Xiajiang Village nowadays. It's really a modern version of dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains. We have changed from the previous cop wall, charcoal burning, and only half year storage of grains. The girls wouldn't marry Xiajiang boys before, but now we have uh, rural tourism, guest houses, fruits, vegetables, and uh, incoming visitors. Everyone is missing General Secretary Xi. We hope that you could come back to Xiajiang village for a talk. And we will always bear in mind the instructions of General Secretary Xi Jinping to build Xiajiang village to be a common wealth demonstration village. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sun Jinglong. I am the Brigade Commander of 71st Group of the PLA Ground Force. My group has 56 honored flags. I have participated in many rehearsals and exercises, and I was involved in international contests with three gold and four silver awards, and I am very proud to be here today, and I will double my efforts to sustain our honor and renew a new chapter of the PLA. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Yu Ruofei. I come from Gansu Blue Sky Rescue Team. And this is a non-profit uh, rescue institution composed of volunteers. In the past one decade, our group has grown from three people to over 1,000, and we've um, conducted over 900 rescue campaigns. We have left our footprint in the disaster relief and life rescue process. Over 70% of our members were born in the 1990s, and please be reassured, we are using our deeds to honor our commitments to our party. Thank you. Now the floor is open to questions and answers. Xinhua News Agency, please. 
Thank you. From Xinhua. And my question goes to Delegate Sun Jinglong. Since the 18th National Congress, China has been speeding up the building of the world class PLA. You come from the grassroots level brigade, so what changes have you felt in person? Thank you for the question. It's really my honor to be part of these delegates. And I used to grow from just a normal soldier to be a commander. In the past one decade, under the influence of uh, strengthening our army proposed by General Secretary Xi Jinping, we have taken on a new look. My impression is that we have firmer confidence and more resolute actions to be prepared for any fight and we take solid steps towards a strengthened army. Also, we have reformed ourselves from traditional infantry to be armored force. We have more professional experience and flexible coordination with stronger capabilities. We have even upgraded our equipment, for example, 191 rifle, 21 type of camouflage clothing, especially in September this year. Our brigade has been equipped with a new type of crawler fighting vehicle. So the soldiers and officials are very proud of ourselves. In addition, we pay attention to cross-regional rehearsal, joint exercise and international contests to train ourselves. Now, those soldiers born in the 1990s and 2000s have been growing up rapidly in such preparations. In one combat rehearsal last year, I took my brigade to conduct uh, the on-field investigation, maintenance, and guarantee work. Finally, with the drone's help, we have precise coverage on the battlefield. So we could daily we could say that uh, such reform has boosted our capacity of fighting, and uh, I was honored to be one of the dream seekers in the journey of strengthening our army. I witnessed the process in person. For example, the vigorous development of preparations of the soldiers and the great development of PLA. Now in this new era, we are burdened with new tasks. We have the confidence, decision, and capacity to conquer all difficulties and all opponents. Thank you. Next question, please, from Zhejiang TV. My question goes to Jiang Lijuan. As you mentioned, General Secretary Xi Jinping used to visit Xiajiang village on several occasions. So what is Xiajiang village been doing lately? And in the journey of a village rejuvenation, what explorations have been done? Thank you for your concern with Xiajiang village. During General Secretary Xi Jinping's stay in Zhejiang province, he used to visit our fields in Xiajiang village for several times. He even go to the local farmer's house for a talk. I listened to the stories of General Secretary Xi when I was young, and uh, the civilians in Xiajiang village have a habit that was to watch the news network every night so as to have um, a view of General Secretary Xi, listen to his words, and see what he has been doing, just like a family member. On April 24, 2003, General Secretary Xi paid his first visit to Xiajiang village. He saw the bare mountains and told us that we must wear a green hat on our mountains. And he has learned about the sewage and the flies, so guided us to build a biogas digester. He said that to build such a biogas digester, he is an expert and a professional. According to him, we embarked on green development pathway. In the past years, we have combined agricultural, tourism, and culture to blaze a new trail suitable to Xiajiang village and create a wealth for the villagers. In Xiajiang village, people's living standard has been boosted. And in 2010, their income has been raised up. It's about 14 times more of per capita disposable income compared to one dozen years before. Many youngsters come back to Xiajiang village just like me. Every year we can get dividend from the village committee. And with 5G remote healthcare, 
we could uh, get an appointment with the doctors from the provincial level big hospitals. So the common people in Xiajiang village are leading a better life. Now, we have extended our work. Together with the surrounding 24 villages, we jointly established such a joint party committee for village rejuvenation. With resource combination, we hope to create a commonwealth alliance. For example, we have four pillar industries like tourism, sorghum, TCM, and agriculture specialties. We are also introducing our brand called the Big Xiajiang Village to add the added value of agricultural products. So such a commonwealth establishment has allowed the commonwealth to increase their income by 10% year on year. Such achievements in Xiajiang village are in true sense shared by the common people here. Now we are trying to replicate this Xiajiang model from Xiajiang to the big Xiajiang commonwealth, from leading the way of creating wealth to enjoying commonwealth. We are grateful and we will use the actual deeds to repay our party and our okay, General thank Secretary Xi. Thank you. Next question, please. From China News Service. My question comes to Yu Ruofei. According to your introduction, you come from a non-profit rescue institution. Could you share with us about the composition of this team? And as you mentioned, over 70% are born in 1990s. So in your perspective, what responsibilities are taken by the youngsters in this new era. Thank you for the question. As I mentioned, we are a team of volunteers. The majority of the members have their full-time job. But since we share aspirations and ideals, every time when a disaster breaks out, it's like an assembly. We will gather together to contribute ourselves. I've participated in Ya'an earthquake in Sichuan, Ludian earthquake in Yunnan, and Nepal earthquake for rescue. We have uh, rescued 81 survivors and treated 600 more people. One most biggest impression of me was that in one earthquake rescue campaign, one survivor was under a beam, so someone must uh, transfer him from behind the beam. But the aftermath is still ongoing. The youngsters are very scared. I hesitated, but since I am a CPC member, I have to step up. So I crawled in the ruins, and everyone applauded for me. At that moment, I felt so proud of being a CPC member. And I was aware of the responsibility of a party member. Even in face of a test of life or death, I must be daring and take the responsibility. Now, in the field of nonprofit rescue, more youngsters and volunteers are joining force. People born in the 1990s, 2000 are becoming the mainstay in all industries. Last year, there was a famous TV series called The Awakening Era. I was so impressed by the TV. Many party members members, even younger than I am, could be able to dedicate themselves for the nation. Now we are living in this new era, so youngsters of this generation must share that aspiration to undertake the responsibilities and missions bestowed on us by this era. Thank you. Thank you, our young delegates. Thank you for your youthful expression, allowing us to feel the charm of our party with 100 years of history. Now the next group of delegates, please. Please give a brief uh, self-instruction of yourselves. Good morning, everyone. I'm Zhou Wei. I'm the secretary of the CPC Kunshan Municipal Community. And uh, this must be a familiar place for you because uh, we are 
on the top 100 county for the past 10 years in China. And not only did we develop our skill in terms of industry, but also have optimized the structure of our industries. And currently, more than 50% of uh, the industries are emerging industries. And we also are seeing greener environment. And this is the birthplace for Quenchu. Not only do we have Quenchu, we also have invited uh, 348 traditional operas to perform here. So this strong economy and well of uh, people and beautiful environment is our new landscape in, in Quenshan. Hello everyone, I'm Yang Yu. I'm from the birthplace of the CPC, the memorial of the first CPC National Congress. So it is our honor to work at the Memorial, um, memorial Center. And uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out that all of our party history start from the first CPC Congress. Therefore, it's important for us to tell the CPC story from its birthplace. I I consider myself uh, extremely lucky. In my 22 years of uh, working experience, I've been telling the revolutionary stories and the culture of the CPC. And standi standing here, I also feel more happy and fortunate to be the person to tell the stories from Shihuaman of Shanghai to Tianmen of Beijing, to from telling about the Congress to participating in the Congress. And I believe that uh, this Congress will be a source of inspiration to me as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lin Zhanxi. I am the chief scientist of China National Engineering Research Center of Jinshao Technologies. And from 1983, I start to do research in terms of edible mushrooms, uh, also known as Jinshao. And uh, with the attention of uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping, the Jinshao technology has become a more national and even global technology that can be applied worldwide. And it has it became the first industry in terms of uh, a poverty elevation effort in helping 17,500 households to get rid of poverty and is known to as the key to wealth and happiness to the local people and also contribute to ecological production and high quality development in the um, Yellow River reaches. And also, we have disseminated this technology to foreign countries to help them with their poverty alleviation efforts. Right now, 106 countries are already benefiting from this technology. The 20th National Congress will be our new beginning to keep our work. Now the floor is open to questions. First question from Economic Daily. Thank you. The question goes to Mr. Zhou Wei. Can you tell us more about the economic situation of Quenshan uh, this year? And uh, we heard rumors concerning the retreat of uh, foreign capital and funds. So, um, does that happen in Kunshan? Thank you so much for your question. You asked about uh, the retreat, possible retreat of uh, foreign uh, capital. I want to share a story with you. Not long ago, a photovoltaic enterprises had made a second term of investment of uh, 1.8 billion USD on top of the 1.3 billion USD first term investment. And August this year, we have met our national targets in terms of uh, foreign investment. Besides, the total trade volume of our county, of our city, is expected to, to reach uh, 100 billion USD on the uh, we are hopeful to get to the top 15 of, our, of all the cities in China. So what is our biggest attraction? What is our biggest highlight in terms of attracting foreign capital? We believe it is because we have a very full-fledged industrial chain. We account for one-third of the global laptop market. 
This is attributable to our full-fledged uh, industrial chain. Currently, we are building the new smart industrial um, industrial chain. We focus on the top enterprises and give them more resources and factors so as to create favorable conditions for them to settle down. Not long ago, we helped a top enterprise in terms uh, uh, to give them uh, to speed up their process of getting the license to help them get a very big order worth of 20 billion. And currently, we are now working on digital economy in terms of strengthening our industry and uh, prioritizing in terms of industrial chains. Despite the complicated international situations, so we are gaining more and more trust from overseas investors and companies and more and more foreign um, and this foreign enterprises are increasing their investment and expand their businesses here. Thank you. Next question. With China Youth Daily. Thank you. The question goes to Ms. Yang Yu. So as a staff of a revolutionary center at the Memorial Hall of the First CPC National Congress, can you tell us some of the stories in your work and how to attract more young people to, uh, to pay visits to the Memorial Center? Thank you. I think it's important for us to educate people of our history in order to have more knowledge of the present and uh, more expectations for the future. I had an experience to share with you. Last year, on June the 16th, I received a group of uh, foreign visitors, including ambassadors from 40 different countries. So I tell the stories about Marxism and uh, some of uh, the efforts and the uh, causes of the CPC. And when talking about uh, the moderately well-off society, a lot of people applauded for me. And after the visit, in private conversations, uh, Ambassador from Gabon said that uh, the CPC always put the people first and that they do all that they can to give the people better life. And uh, the Albania ambassador mentioned that uh, there are no other Marxist uh, party that is as successful as the CPC. So I came to realize that that applause is for the CPC. I think our story is greatly influential worldwide, so it's our duty to share with the world a more truthful and comprehensive image of the CPC. In terms of uh, attracting more young audience, young visitors to come to the center, I believe that it's important to build this kind of uh, re um, reciprocity I think the ones that are telling the stories should, uh, listening to the story should be the ones that tells the story. We did a research. In the past five years, more and more young people are paying visits to our Memorial Center. Especially last year, um, the visitors under the age of uh, 35 is increased by 23.6%. I think the revolutionary culture is become more and more appealing to the young people, and we are also keeping up with the times to seek new ways in, uh, in terms, uh, including live streaming, uh, sitcom, and short videos, and these are our new forms and uh, platforms to tell the stories of the party well and so that more people can understand the spirit of the CPC. We believe that revolutionary culture can be inherited and can be um, also carried on. Thank you. Next question. Next question from China Daily. 
Thank you, with China Daily. My question goes to Mr. Lin Zhenxi. You were a, the expert on the prototype character from the TV series Shanghai Qing, and the technology of Jun Cao not only helped the, um, the poverty-stricken areas in Ningxia, but also helped a lot of uh, countries and regions among the Belt and Road Initiative. So can you tell us more about some of the stories? Thank you. I think in terms of the globalization of Jinxiao technology, in our first step, uh, we are in, in Papua New, New Guinea. And 20 years ago, this place is still experiencing, still in the midst of this uh, tribal economy. And uh, it's a great challenge for us to help them to learn modern technologies such as Jinxiao technologies. So it's important for us to simplify and localize the, the technology so that more people can have easy access to this technology. I believe that uh, on the celebration ceremony to um, this technology, we have uh, witnessed the ministers of the local government and uh, their chief executive join this, this celebration, and they were singing and enchanting China and Jinxiao, Jinxiao and China. In order to remember this assistance from China, one of the ministers even changed the name of his daughter into Jinxiao. And since then, more and more people from South Pacific, from Africa and Latin America have shaken off poverty and live a well of life through the raising of the mushrooms in Jun's house. We have also conducted training, and out of these training courses, there are more than um, 12,000 people that have graduated from this course. We also have uh, trained 24 overseas students in this specialty. The technology has been translated into 18 languages. These talents are helping their own country and people now to live a well of life. In 2017, Jinxiao Technology has been listed as one of the major projects of the China UN Peaceful Development Fund. And we are contributing to the 2030 UN SDG, and this is our China's wisdom and China plan. Thank you. As mentioned, Mr. Lin was the prototype of an agriculture expert in the TV series, and he has over 56 years of history as a party member. So my honor goes to you. Thank you again. Now let's invite the next group of delegates. Please do your self-introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Suliati Simai, and I am the Deputy Party Secretary and Vice President of Kashgar University. I grew up in Xinjiang. Ever since my graduation from Peking University as a doctorate degree holder, with the faith of building the border, I came back to my hometown to be a university teacher so as to pass on the knowledge. In the past one decade, as to the transformations in Xinjiang, I could feel it. For many times, on the occasion of the UN Human Rights Council, I've been telling the stories of a real Xinjiang to combat all those malicious rumors and discredit of Xinjiang. To be able to be here for this solemn session, I am deeply honored. 
together with all the other educators, I will work hard to build an education-based strong country. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ting Butter. I come from the grassland of Inner Mongolia, and I have been the secretary for four decades in Gacha. Many people ask me, as a son of a commander, how could I be stationed here for 48 years? I came here in the pasture land since I was 19 years old. When I first arrived, I saw how hard the local herdsmen were living. There were no roads, no electricity, no telecommunication services. 90% of the children here haven't been to school. Once, I took back a radio after my business trip, and in the leisure time, all the herdsmen came to my house to listen to the radio and the stories from it. It struck me that I should be rooted in this grassland so as to build it into a beautiful place together with the locals. We must protect the pasture ecology and allow the herdsmen to live a better life. Years later, we built a new road and introduced electricity services and we also built the signal tower for the mobile phones. Children of herdsmen gradually went to school. Many of them have already graduated from the university, and they came back. I told them that we must allow technology to empower grazing so that there will be better ecology in the grassland, and the locals will live a wealthier life. So now many herdsmen are using the drones for grazing, and in their computers, they can see the cow and sheep on the pasture remotely. They could use the remote control on their cell phone to fetch water autonomously. And also, the weeding process is being machine-based. To be here, to participate in the 20th National Congress of CPC, I am very pleased. It is a great encouragement to me to stay here in the grassland, and I would be more than happy to take the herdsmen to protect our ecology so that the herdsmen could live a wealthier life. That is my initial mission. Thank you. Thank you, Tim Butter. You are very humble. Many media friends may have covered his stories. Last year, he won the highest honor of our party, the July 1st medal. And standing right next to him, Delegate Yang Ning from Miao Ethnicity is also a person representative of poverty alleviation efforts. Welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Yang Ning. I come from Rongshui Miao Autonomous County of Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. I graduated since 2010 and came back to my hometown to be a village and official as a college graduate. Jiangmen Village is a poverty-stricken village. It was poor. So the first day on my arrival, I thought, what can I do for this village? Over the years, I helped the villagers to sell their bamboo and um, lead them to grow peppers and the roots of kutsu vine, but it was nothing more than a failure. Villagers questioned me, what can a little girl do? I was sad, and I was at a loss. I cried for long, but then it dawned on me that I was still young. Even if I fail, I could still get up on my feet. It's no big deal. So in 2017, I invited the poverty-stricken households to grow the rice special in the mountainous areas. I even sell my house for my wedding's purpose and buy the rice, ducks, and fish and give them for free to the villagers. We had a bumper year and we finally got rid of poverty. Sincere dedication helped me to win the hearts of the villagers. In 2020, I was appointed as the party secretary of the village. 
in the past 12 years, per capita income of Xiangme village has increased by 15 times, and I have become the backbone of the village instead of just an innocent college graduate. And I was even awarded by General Secretary Xi Jinping. I was encouraged and inspired. Youth is glowing because of the hardship we endure, and I will continue to be stationed in the Miao ethnicity and make more efforts to make the Miao mountains more beautiful, the Miao villages wealthier, and the Miao people happier. Thank you. And in the interest of time, this group of delegates will receive only one question. CGTN. My question goes to Julia T. Simayi. Since for long, you were in the business of education in Xinjiang, and you've told stories of Xinjiang in the United Nations. So what are the changes and stories in Xinjiang that impress you the most? Thank you for the question. Not long ago, I came back from Geneva as a Chinese scholar. I was in Geneva for the Human Rights Council to tell the stories and changes in Xinjiang. In the past one decade, the annual gross product in Xinjiang has doubled, and per capita disposable income has doubled as well. That's a record high. And uh, people of all ethnicities in Xinjiang are enjoying a stable, safer, and more developed, happier life. For many people, those might just be abstract concepts and data, but for me, who has been grown up here, those are tangible changes. And I would love to share with you about one case that we have followed for long. In Winsu County, Aksu, there is a girl called Rukyam Abdur Im. After graduation from the junior high, she learned embroidery in a local vocational school. Then in Urumqi, she served as an apprentice in a clothing factory. Now she came back to hometown to start up her own business. Under the national policy, financial and technological support, she founded her own plant of embroidery and lead the local women to embroider their colorful life. Maybe from the angle of education, it's more convincing. In the past one decade, education quality has been elevated in Xinjiang. We are writing the stories of how knowledge is changing destinies. Over the years, an increasing number of children are going elsewhere for education. And likewise, more students from other provinces are coming to Xinjiang to complete their studies. In one dorm, you may find students of uh, different ethnicities. They are enjoying their time together. For example, in Kashgar University, where I am working now, if you visit the canteen in our campus, there are multiple offerings of cuisines. Some might be the newly sought after places for the influentials. And in the past one decade, the disciplinary change can also reflect the transformation in Xinjiang. Linguistics, e-commerce, logistics, and other disciplines are being popular lately. That's because the national development strategy has put Xinjiang in the front line of openness instead of an inland province. Rely on our unique resources, industries, geographical location, and culture, Xinjiang has become an important logistics hub and the talents and assets concentration place along the DRI initiative. As an educator, I witness how tens of thousands of graduates are leading their life here in Xinjiang, and I am so relieved. There are a lot more similar stories around me. Welcome to visit the real Xinjiang, and I'm convinced that the future of Xinjiang will be better. We welcome you here to be our guests. Thank you. As Zulia has mentioned, we hope that more media friends could come to see the real Xinjiang in person. Thank you again, Zulia Ti.
and Ting Butter from Inner Mongolia, and Yang Ning from Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. Thank you, you three. Now the next group of delegates, please. So, self-introductions first, please. And starting from Wang Xudong. Hello, everyone. I am Wang Xudong from the Palace Museum. In 1991, I worked at the uh, Mogaoku or as the curator. And after working there for eight years, I uh, came to the Palace Museum to guard another important uh, um, intangible cultural heritage of China. And uh, in the 19th National Congress, I represent Dunhuang. And uh, this year, I represent uh, the Palace Museum. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Qian Su Yun. I'm a pediatrician from the uh, Pediatric Intensive Care of Beijing Children's Hospital, also known as the ICU, the last defense line against death uh, that protects people's life, and they're also known as the special force in hospitals. I've been working in this area for more than 39 years so, uh, with my teams. Uh, we saved um, the lives of more than 20,000 kids. And uh, it's my honor to join the um, 20th National Congress. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Xie Chun Tao, the Vice President of Harvard School of the CPC Central Committee. And five years ago, I participated in the 19th National CPC National Congress. And it's my honor to join the party congress again this year. Thank you. Now the floor is open to questions. First question from the reporter of Guangming Daily. My question goes to Ms. Chen Su Yun. So the PICU work is uh, of high risk and high intensity. A lot of young people would be hesitating when choosing their specialty. How do you think we should attract more young uh, talents to join this career and this course? Thank you for the question. As you mentioned, pediatrics is a very comprehensive school in medicine because it deals with uh, the children's group and uh, it concerns uh, the disease of uh, all of the physical systems. Take our hospital, for example, we have more than 40 clinical specialties, so it's a very big, um, very big discipline. From another regard, we cannot treat the children as a simply as a small version of the adults. I think there are several characters to this specialty. First is that uh, their development of the disease might change in a second. And second is that some kids have difficulty describing precisely their symptoms. And uh, currently, the development of uh, China's pediatric, uh, pediatric still has room f for development. But we have made major improvement over the past years, especially since the 18th National Congress. We are seeing an increase in numbers of uh, children's hospital as well as pediatricians. For example, um, the PICU where I am in can be found, could only be found in major cities and big hospitals in the past. But in the past 10 years, so we are seeing more and more PICU established in some local hospitals. And uh, this would uh, uh, help the children to be better treated 
especially when they are in dire situation. We have also established uh, China's uh, pediatrician center and the regional pediatri uh, pediatric center so that uh, the local hospitals can also improve their capacity in terms of treatment and diagnosis for the, uh, for the kids. We believe that in the future, with the development of uh, our sector and also the provincial policies applied to our sector, more and more young people will uh, find this job, find this uh, specialty appealing. Thank you. Next question. This report is from Argentina. My question goes to Mr. Wang Xu Dong. You mentioned that it's important for us to build a platform to connect the relics uh, with the museums and uh, to enhance the understanding between different nations and ethnic groups. So what are your thoughts in terms of strengthening cultural communication in the new era? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question and your interest in relics and cultural heritage protection. I think it, it, my answer has a lot to do with my own work. In the past 30 years, as a guardian of uh, the relics, as I mentioned, uh, I began my work in Gansu Dunhuang in 1991, and uh, I consider myself a guardian of this important c cultural relics. And uh, the development of this grotto is actually a, um, a essence of the Buddhism culture as well as the Chinese culture. I think it's a major manifestation of the inclusiveness of the Chinese culture because um, the Buddhism originates from India, but it has become localized, uh, highly localized in China. And uh, after leaving the Mughal Caves, I came to the ba Palace Museum. We know that this palace was built during the Ming and Qing dynasty and uh, it's home to many cultural relics and its embodiment of the 5,000 years of history in China. And from these relics, we see that uh, um, China is a big family with uh, people of different ethnic groups and cultural backgrounds, and uh, the communication and exchanges between the different groups is the key to the consistency of the Chinese civilizations over the thousands of years of history. And this is also what makes us so uh, still so livable and uh, so um, vigorous even after thousands of years, this diversity of culture is our key to that. Therefore, I believe that uh, as a guardian of the relics, I've uh, participated in a lot of uh, international symposiums concern concerning the protection of uh, cultural relics, and uh, I uh, communicated with the colleagues from all over the world, and uh, they came all the way to China to participate in the effort of the protection of cultural heritages. The reason why they would uh, go all the way is that these cultural relics are also embodiment of uh, um, the mutual values of the humanities as well. I think it is our duty to seek common grounds while reserving differences. Mutual understanding is our priority. I believe that once there was an American expert saying that they will, I, uh, is saying that uh, I will leave one day, but you will be here forever uh, because you are the host of this place. Um, but we hope that we can work together to carry out the experiment. But 
even after 30 years, they will come to the Mogao caves every year. The reason why they are so persistent as well. I think it is thought-provoking because we've found a common purpose as cultural heritage protectors. To protect the cultural heritage is to protect um, this kind of uh, common treasure of the world and contribute to world peace. I visited many museums across the world and each time I go to a different place, I discover that the relics are not only an object, they are the carrier of the local history and uh, culture. So it is important for museums to carry out conversations as well. I think uh, it is our way to seek common grounds and uh, re reserve our differences, set aside our differences. This should be our common cause and uh, um, central concept and principle that we should follow. I think the Palace Museum carries major duty on its shoulder in terms of preserving um, and protect China's uh, natural, uh, China's uh, cultural heritage. We are building ourselves into a center of a cultural communication and tourism. Our mission cannot be fulfilled by ourselves, so we call for participants and the participation across all walks of life from home and abroad. This is our major perspective and aspiration. We have uh, made some initial plans based on our past experiences and some of the best practices that we had in the past. For example, in terms of curation, we are planning to work with uh, other museums to exchange cultural heritage for exhibitions. We are also planning to curate some cross-cultural exhibitions. Second, in terms of academic exchanges, we have uh, successfully held five um, Asian exhibition, uh, exhibition of Asian cultures. And we are hoping that uh, the scholars from different uh, parts of the world would also come to join this forum to share with us their civilizations and cultures as well. General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out on multiple occasions that it's important for us to absor absorb the essence of different uh, civilizations and cultures from the world. This is also our working principle. Third, cultural exchange. It's a mutual way people to people exchange. We have a Thai Hill plan. For the young scholars in the Palace Museum, we encourage them to go global, to visit the cultural institutions, museums, and universities for more academic exchange with our counterparts internationally. We will share the Chinese stories with them. And in return, we invite scholars of all countries to visit the Palace Museum for research. From their perspective, what's their take on the 5,000 years of civilization? showcased in the Palace Museum. So we share our stories in mutual ways. I believe that uh, such a storytelling method will be helpful for our communication and mutual understanding. Academically, that will help to strengthen our people-to-people -people confidence and even faith in nations and for all the suspicions and differences, we could gradually diffuse them. And more importantly, we respect different civilizations, customs, and 
even the diversity of culture and religions. Besides, palace museums have two training institutions about uh, the Society of uh, Cultural Relic Protection, for example. Through those two institutions, we can help to cultivate the talents in this field. And scholars from all other countries can be trained here on this platform. They could get some idea of Chinese culture. In the training course, scholars from different backgrounds can learn each other's culture and find our similarities. Of course, we can reserve our own differences. So we start from the training of youth. In that way, cultural exchange and cultural relic protection will help the museums and culture to give better play. Because after all, museums are like the bridge between the past, present, and future. It's regret regretful that I've never been to Argentina or South America. I've been looking forward to visit there because Argentina has very unique culture, and I will surely treasure any opportunity if I get it to visit the South American countries like Argentina. And also I welcome our media friends to visit the Palace Museum. We invite you to understand the fine traditional Chinese culture exhibited in the Palace Museum. Of course, against the backdrop of the pandemic, we need to make an appointment online. There will be a limit of visitors every day. In the future, one ticket can even be bought or appointed in the future. But that's OK. We have the Digital Museum. You could go into our applet of Palace Museum to visit the Digital Museum. Of course, if you have any questions, you can call our hotline 400 to ask for help. 400 Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wang Xudong. I myself is a fan of traditional Chinese culture, especially the Palace Museum culture. Not long ago, there was an exhibition about uh, the study room in ancient China in the Palace Museum. And also you have held a lot of uh, the Dunhua-related culture. And uh, there will be many cross-cultural exhibitions as well to be staged in the Palace Museum. We are looking forward to it. Next question, please. From Economist. Hello, I am a reporter from The Economist, and I have a question. How will history record this year's 20th National Congress of CPC? That's a very good question with historical sense. I've been studying the history of the CPC, and I reviewed our previous national congresses and their role in the reform and opening up process. Ever since 1978, the Communist Party of China has held eight national congresses of the CPC. In the eight sessions, there have been many major decisions. For example, the selection of the Central Committee has been very helpful to boost China's reform and opening up in an efficient way, as well as the modernization process. Those sessions are the platform for the CPC to lead all Chinese people to build a world of society in a around way. Today, all party members and people of all ethnicities in China have already embarked on the new journey of building a modernized country in the socialist era, and we are now marching toward the second centenary goal. So at this critical moment, we are holding the 20th CPC National Congress. According to the published agenda and arrangement during the session, I think this National Congress will be significant in at least three ways. That means it will be recorded in history from three perspectives. First of all, the report of the 20th National Congress 
will be beneficial for the development of China in the next five years or even longer. I was involved in the solicitation of this report. And I dare say that the drafting, the opinion solicitation, and improvement of the draft have been carefully prepared. The central government has been fully prepared for this report. And the efforts made towards that goal have really been seen in other parties. Ever since we determined the date of the National Congress, we started the solicitation of the agenda, and people from all circles of lives have studied the major topics to be discussed in the National Congress for the deliberation of the central government. And ever since the draft of uh, the report has come out. There is another round of solicitation of opinion. And also, uh, the Political Bureau Conference has amended that draft again. And then there was a second round of opinion solicitation. I have to say that the number of people involved in such opinion solicitation exceeded 4,700. Also, not long ago, the seventh plenary session of the 19th CPC was held, and it deliberated this draft again. And I was part of the members in that conference. The discussion has been full, and every present member has the opportunity to propose their revising suggestions to the central government for some very important opinions they were accepted timely by the central government. After the seventh plenary session was concluded, almost every member agreed that there was no more recommendation at all because the draft was well prepared enough. So I believe this report is very thorough and profound. And the 20th National Congress will play a leading role in China's development. And it will help to usher in a faster, more steady, and better modernized country. And secondly, in this session, we will revise the CPC chapter. And as you know, we attached great importance to that task. There have been 20 conferences among the party members just for that purpose. Almost every party conference will shoulder on the task of the revision of the party chapter. So the history of CPC has been witnessed by the chapters. The important theories, decisions, systems, and uh, regulations will be timely reflected and enshrined in the chapters in order to guide the activities of the party, the party members, and the party organizations of all levels included. So it took us a long time in the revision. Personally, I feel that the revision has been very complete and full. It will help us to have comprehensive governance of the party in this new era, and there will be a series of regulations accordingly. After the revision, it will also help to standardize the development of the party. And the CPC will be guided by the party constitution to be the core of the Chinese undertakings and all Chinese people. Third, in this session, we will produce the new round of Central Committee. And the whole world has been putting their sight on this topic. 
as to the selection of cages. The CPC has over 100 years of efforts and practices. We have accumulated a pile of experience. So we've come to a complete set of standardized and effective mechanism in that regard. I myself am familiar with the history of the CPC, and in the recent two decades, I had many opportunities to engage with the other parties. For example, some major parties in the UK, I once got in contact with them. And I feel that among all the parties in the world, there is no one party like the CPC that attaches so much importance to the selection and appointment of cages. We observe scientific and precise principles. We select uh, the most representative, excellent members and it's really seen in the foreign parties. I used to be a delegate of the 19th National Congress as well, and now a delegate of the 20th National Congress. So I can say that this result has been hard won. And the party members in my entity must have their confidence in me. They must recommend me. And the number must be the majority, otherwise I could never be a delegate. And also, the opinion must be submitted to the upper level party organization for more check. If I have any problem, for example, in terms of uh, the uh, anti-corruption efforts, I must live up to the requirements, otherwise I may fail as a delegate. Also, there must be several rounds of party-related conferences for the selection. And such a selection must be based on a competitive base. And about 15% uh, in, in terms of uh, competitiveness, that means about 15% of the nominated person will not be elected. So those that are finally elected are the best of the best. And after I became a, a substitute delegate for the 19th National Congress, I learned that you need to go through several rounds of, uh, nomina uh, of uh, nominations before being elected, and uh, about uh, 150 delegates were not finally elected as delegates. Because there are one, more than 160 alternate delegates, but out of them, about 150 will not be made official delegates for the 20th Party Congress. It is not, become, not because they are not capable, it is because that we only choose the best out of the best. We need to make sure that the delegates that are elected should be the best representatives of the people. And uh, we have full confidence that we will choose the new leaders, the new party central committee that can represent uh, our interests. I believe that through my explanations in the past, the 20th National uh, Congress of the CPC will become an important step for us to realize national rejuvenation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Xie Chun Tao, and our thanks also goes to all of the delegates. Thank you. That's all for today's Delegates Corridor. We can see that a lot of uh, the delegates are walking into the 
conference room, and uh, we are about to witness the opening of the 20th National Congress, and uh, we will ha later be arranging a second delegates corridor today. Thank you. Well, 15 delegates met mm. the media. Mm. It is actually a very good opportunity for them to express their thoughts, mm. uh, their concerns, mm. their expectations to the National Congress. And, uh, you know, the tradition of this corridor, right. this delegates corridor, started from the 19th National mm. Congress mm. of the uh, of uh, the CPC. Mm. And on the 20th uh, National Congress, it mm. will happen not only today, mm. but will happen upon the conclusion of uh, the uh, of the party congress as well indeed and i believe many would be uh, very much impressed mm. by the diversity in the delegates right. backgrounds the and also indeed is very wide indeed mm. and also the depth in in their answers uh, right. to journalists so after hearing the prospects and also concerns addressed by those delegates i want to turn to our guest today uh, mr wang the spectrum of uh, the delegates are broadly representative, uh, so, so are the topics. So what topics stood out for you uh, among those 15 delegates? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite impressive and, uh, and, and really outstanding. I mean, you can see how diversified uh, they have been selected and represented uh, so throughout China, also from many from grassroots. Mm -hmm. But I was really impressed with, uh, with this uh, uh, you know, parties are from Zhejiang, uh, from uh, this village that they actually talk about uh, the, uh, uh, how they can do the common prosperity and how that uh, the Zhejiang has really been uh, 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 a really a pioneer and model for that. So that's really important because we have been lifted 800 million people out of poverty in the last four decades. Probably for the next uh, centennial goal, we want to, you know, make another one billion middle class. We already have 400 million you know, middle class now. So this common prosperity is really important. So that's really impressed me. And of course, all the uh, delegates are speaking well. I mean, from academic, from, uh, you know, space uh, agency, <laughs> astronaut, and all those people. But another thing is that I was really impressed with this uh, uh, party like from uh, Quinsan, mm. the number one county. They continue to attract foreign investment, and then they still have the billions of uh, investment right. coming in. So that's impressive. That shows how our local government to, uh, to really ad attract uh, foreign investment, even at the county level. But also in Quinsan, we know that there's a famous uh, Duke Quinsan University <laughs> is really located there. So you can see how open mm -hmm. that uh, the local officials are. And uh, of course, we also have this, uh, finally, this uh, uh, this uh, party, uh, uh, you know, uh, ch uh, uh, you know, vice president from the uh, party school, which I, I think he spoke very well as well. You know, all the <laughs> how the selection, election, right. and all the how to represent it. So mm -hmm. I think it's a wide ranging. Uh, right. Right. Indeed, many impressive uh, thoughts and ideas from uh, those uh, delegates. Right. Our coverage and uh, continues, right. and our reporter Zhao Yingfei joins us now from the Great Hall of the People. Hello, Yingfei. Tell us more about the upcoming opening session of the 20th CPC National Congress. Panda and Donnie, I'm here in the Great Hall of the People, and behind me is the Great Auditorium in the Great Hall of the People. That's where the opening session of the 20th CBC National Congress will be convened. And now behind me, you can see the crowd, the delegates are now entering the hall. Let me show you the scene behind me. Uh, it looks like now some of the delegates are, are mingling and uh, some of them are walking in. Uh, a lot of them are very excited. As we filmed this morning, a lot of them wave their hands for us and uh, it's certainly a very exciting day for them. And also a very serious day for them because they have to make, a, uh, they are very responsible for what they need to do during this National Party Congress. There are more than 2,000 party uh, delegates uh, attending. They come from all around the country and they come from all walks of life. Uh, village party secretaries, entrepreneurs, social workers, and many others who have made significant contributions uh, in their own position or to the country. And uh, uh, there are a lot of, they have a lot of work to do during the National Party Congress. Uh, review the uh, course of, uh, review the work uh, of the past five years and chart the course for future as well as uh, uh, elect new central leadership. Now, uh, specifically, they're here today to listen to a report. The report is submitted by the 19th CPC Central Committee. It's certainly the highlight of the day as people are looking forward to seeing how the country's uh, governing party uh, reflect on its growth and changes and how it is setting vision for future development. 
In the new era, China has set a blueprint for high quality development as the country shifts a focus from quantity to quality. And that can be achieved in multiple fronts, from boosting innovation to uh, promoting eco-friendly environment and uh, improving people's livelihood. And also from the global perspective, the Communist Party of China is the world's largest governing party. So what's, how is China further strengthening its reform and opening up What's China's uh, strategy to tackle global issues? The world is uh, closely watching this report for China's solution. Now, besides the report by the Central Committee, a work report by the uh, 19th CPC Central Commission for In Discipline Inspection, and an amendment to the CPC Constitution will also be submitted to the uh, Party Congress for examination and deliberation. Now, ahead of the National Party Congress, the 19th CPC Central Committee concluded its last plenary session. So, uh, a communique described the, uh, plenary, the past five years as extraordinary and unusual. So, the 20th National Party Congress comes at a critical time as the, um, and also provides a guideline uh, for the party's firm endeavor for governing the nation uh, in a changing global landscape. Back to you, Dong and Pan Dong. Thank you very much, our reporter Zhao Yingfei and Great Hall of the People. You're watching CGTN. This is our special coverage on the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. We'll come back soon, so stay tuned. In my view, the upcoming Party Congress is a big event for China and also for the rest of the world. China's development is critical to the world. China has become a locomotive of the world economy, so China's development and achievements will have positive impacts on the world. The upcoming Congress will design a new blueprint for China's development, which will undoubtedly inject momentum into global development. The CPC is guiding China and the Chinese people to move forward and make progress. So the CPC National Congress is uniquely important, as it will chart the course for China's future development. As far as Pakistan-China relations are concerned, we are forever friends. And we have forever been friends. We don't talk. The Chinese and the Chinese government is not about just their words. They're about their actions. We're really looking forward uh, to this meeting. I think it's going to be a historic event uh, and it will have an impact within obviously your own country, but I think the whole world is waiting to see. The whole world will pay close attention to the agenda and discussions at the upcoming 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China to be held this October. Venezuela will pay special attention to the discussions at the Congress about the model of Chinese socialism. We are attaching importance to how President Xi Jinping will lead the CPC in further developing socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now watching our special coverage on the National Congress of CPC, the 20th National Congress of CPC. But during the past five years, the CPC has put forward a series of major strategic measures pointing out the direction for the development of the party and the country. And now for more on that, my colleague Hona is joining me in the studio. Hona. They're donating to understand the overarching goals and the strategic layout of the party. We have to understand the background as socialism with Chinese char characteristics has entered this new era. The principal contradiction facing Chinese society has evolved. What we now face is the contradiction between the unbalance and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing need for a better life. China has met the basic needs for over a billion people and it, it has eradicated ex extreme poverty by end of 2020 in order to meet the people's needs for a better life. There are so many things to consider. Not only have their material and cultural needs grown, their demands for democracy, rule of law, fairness and justice, security and a better environment are increasing. 
Well, based on the comprehensive analysis of both the international and domestic situation, as well as China's current stage of development, the 19th CPC National Congress has made proposals that would come into two stages. In Xi Jinping's report at the 19th CPC National Congress, he said in the first stage, from 2020 to 2035, the CPC will build on the foundation created by the moderately prosperous society with further 15 years of hard work to see that socialist modernization is basically realized. And in the second stage, from 2035 to the middle of the 21st century, the CPC will work hard and develop China into a modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. To achieve these two centenary goals, realize the Chinese dream of great rejuvenization of the Chinese nation. Development will be the CPC's top priority when it comes to governance and rejuvenating the country. China's economy has changed from a stage of rapid growth to a stage of high quality development. This is a pivotal stage for transforming the growth mod model and improving the economic structure and fostering new drivers of growth. Well, definitely building a modern economic system is an urgent and strategic goal for China's development. Back to you, Doni. All right, thank you very, very much, Hona. Well, those uh, strategic plannings have guided China to make uh, significant achievements on various fronts. So we now take a closer look with our reporters. Uh, Bin joins us live from Shanghai and Huangfei is in the southern city of uh, Guangzhou and Xu Xinchen in Chengdu in China's uh, southwest. I'll start with you, Bin. Uh, the, in 2013, China set up its first pilot free trade zone in Shanghai, a test bed of the new opening up policies. What has changed for the city and for the whole country since then? Yeah, Dongning, you know, Shanghai is considered the pioneer of China's reform and opening up. Well, behind me, I think many of our viewers may recognize one of the most iconic skylines in the world. The east of Huangpu River, or Pudong, has seen huge transformation in the past decades and is a vivid example of China's growth under the reform and opening up policy. Well, in 1990, uh, Shanghai established the country's first bounded area, and in 2013, the city became home to China's first the pile of free trade zone. Many of the reforms and the preferential policies are tested in the FTZ for replication in other parts of China. And one of them is the negative list management system, which was first tested in Shanghai in 2013. And uh, the list includes uh, the sectors in which foreign investment is prohibited or restricted. And by taking a look at how the uh, list has changed over the years, we can clearly see China's commitment to opening up. When the list was first released in 2013, it had 190 entries, and now it only has 27. And uh, that's just one of the many reforms tested in the FTZ. China now has 21 free trade zones covering most provinces. And authorities say they will be given more space in the future to carry out border reforms and to continuously improve China's business environment. Dong Ying. Thank you very much, our reporter Wu Bing in Shanghai. Now we go to our reporter Huang Fei in Guangzhou. So we know the Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Guangzhou Metropolitan Cluster has ranked a second for three consecutive years on the list of the world's geographical innovation clusters published by the World Intellectual Property Organization. Tell us more about the core competitiveness of this particular region. Hello, Pandeng. I'm here at Guangzhou's Central Business District, part of the regional tech hub connecting neighboring Shenzhen and Hong Kong across the border. As you mentioned in the report, uh, well, the key is really matching domestic innovation with international tech transfer. On the upstream, we have world-class basic research from Hong Kong and Macau universities here. Some of them have labs based right here in Guangdong. On the downstream, there is a strong industrial network of raw materials uh, to advanced uh, equipment, which means prototyping and manufacturing capabilities uh, for startups. Um, and across the border, Hong Kong really serves as a key fundraising hub and a launch pad to markets around the world. Rail and road expansions, meanwhile, have been designed to make these resources available within an hour's uh, commute. In the last decade, China has also built the world's biggest 5G network, with the majority of base stations located in Shenzhen. That's helped accelerate progress in artificial intelligence, semiconductor and biotechnology, among many critical sectors. 
Um, and it hasn't been without challenges, but we have seen strong policy determination from the top. The government promising billions in R&D each year, better data access across the border, as well as continued talent exchange to gather top minds in the region. So technological self-reliance will be front and center as companies try to carve out their own paths in a new decade of intensifying global competition. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huang Fei, reporting from Guangzhou. And now let's turn to Chengdu in China's uh, southwest. And as we mentioned, Xu Xinchen is there. So Xinchen, China eradicated absolute poverty by the end of 2020 and has since been pushing for rural vitalization. Uh, the per capita disposable income for rural residents has more than doubled in the past decade. It's a great achievement. What has made such progress possible? absolutely don't need to be honest the number is almost a hundred million people live out of poverty and look right here and these are one of the many secrets for china to accomplish this it was a journey of eight years of hard work and right here agricultural specialties fruits to be more specific here in southwest china so i'm currently inside one of china's largest e-commerce companies headquarters in southwest china thousands of parcels pass through these companies every day and one third of them fruits like this that amount to a hundred thousand uh, shipments and farmers are growing their incomes with fruits like this local specialties however before china's uh, party alleviation efforts kicked in it was so hard for these fruits to reach across china to reach the 1.4 billion mass market and behind me we can see this live feed of a logistics centers all man robotic arms working their magics. So improved connectivity has been another secret for China to achieve its party alleviation efforts. In the past decade, China fixed and constructed almost 100,000 kilometers of highway in poor areas, improving connectivity. And in the past decade, we've seen fast urban urbanizations in larger cities, especially along the East Coast. And now we're also seeing fast rural revitalization in smaller places with better access to roads, traffic, and health education and many more don't need. thank you very much Xinchen. by the way i love your prop there all right xu xinchen reporting from chengdu in southwest china and about all the achievements and let's uh, get back to our discussions with uh, our two guests uh, victor i'll turn to you first earlier this week the 19th uh, central committee of the communist party of china concluded its uh, seventh plenary session in Beijing and issued a communique which reviewed the work done over the past five years. So how would you review the changes done uh, by China in the past five years and what's actually behind those changes? Well, first of all, the last uh, the past five years have been very challenging. Uh, first of all, we have this uh, pandemic which hit China and the rest of the world and mankind is still not yet completely out of the woods yet. And China has been practicing this dynamic zero COVID policy, which uh, has been generating huge benefits for saving as many people in China from deaths or infections. But on the other hand, has also caused a lot of inconveniences which need to be overcome in order to achieve sustainable economic development. So this is a big uh, landmark change in the five uh, years in the past. Secondly, China has gone through tremendous amount of challenges in its relations with the West, mainly because there is one superpower which is not yet coming to terms with the fact that China is rapidly rising in peaceful terms and it's probably trying to do whatever it can, try to hold China down. And China needs to stand firm to defend its legitimate interest and sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that has a major impact on China's relations with the rest of the world. And then further, China is really making major breakthroughs in technology and innovation and entrepreneurship. And the structure and the nature and the mix of Chinese economy is fast changing as we speak. And it is generally expected that China will really move into the forefront of technological innovation as a result of the push over the past five years. And it is expected to continue in the next five years to come. To be self-reliant on all fronts. Indeed. Absolutely. Now let's get more updates. Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, would deliver the major content of the report of the 19th CPC Central Committee at the opening session of the 20th CPC National Congress. CGTN will bring you live coverage on that. Do stay tuned. 
Now let's go back to our uh, guests. Uh, Mr. Wan, I'd like to uh, follow up on your uh, earlier uh, notions regarding uh, China's efforts in attracting foreign investment. You were quite impressed by the uh, remarks from uh, uh, the uh, party secretary of uh, Kunshan uh, City. Um, uh, but looking at looking forward to the next five years and even even beyond, how how would you say um, China's reform and opening up and its juke circulation will pan out? Well, I think this is uh, uh, absolutely for the last five to ten years, China has made uh, remarkable progress for actually the uh, attracting foreign investment. Now we are, you know, for the last uh, ten years, basically, China kept uh, you know, GDP growth around six percent, and uh, uh, and also we have, uh, you know. Uh, added our uh, speed rail, we, we we actually tripled that uh, uh, in networks of that, and also we have uh, you know the GDP has actually doubled for the last decade. So that's that's enormous progress under the uh, you know the, the leadership of uh, the, the Central Committee headed by President Xi. So so I think that is really uh, paved the way for the further uh, attraction of the foreign investment because anywhere you go in the world, where is the best synergy? You have a upstream, downstream. You have a very talented working class. You know, we have 280 million college graduates among our populations, and also China is actually innovation and entrepreneurship spirit is driving throughout China. So there's no place in the world probably has such a highly sophisticated and efficient and highly functioning logistic. We have 1.5 5G stations and another 5 million 4G stations. Anywhere you go is very connected. So this is really have uh, showed enormous attraction to any investor, foreign investor coming from the world. And President Xi said again and again, China's door will open wider. I'm sure this is going to be, again, the message from uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, this current uh, party's Congress and yeah. also the globalization will continue and China will continue to contribute you know, over one third of global GDP growth, which is more than the G7 countries combined. So that's enormous. I think that is really the strength and the trackness and also continuity and the stability that China will contribute to the world. Indeed, and Mr. Gao Kunshan is not exactly far from your hometown. So I believe <laughs> Kunshan yeah. is not a sole example in its success in attracting foreign investment and also, more importantly, establishing uh, a food supply chain and also industrial uh, chain. And we've also seen many cities arising in China's central parts, um, the southwestern parts and even western, uh, the larger western uh, region. Um, how would you uh, make of this momentum in the next five years and even beyond? Indeed, uh, Kunshan is part of Suzhou, and I'm a native of Suzhou, mm. so we are very proud of the achievements in Kunshan and in my hometown Suzhou as a whole. I would say over the past 44 years, a huge number of foreign enterprises have moved in to China, starting in the coastal areas, but then more and more penetrating into all parts of China. And they come not because politically they want to do it, but because commercially and economically they believe there is a profit to be made in the China market. Therefore, when there are some Western countries which demand their enterprises move out of China, I hope they will realize that the enterprises and businesses make their own business decisions. They do not want to listen to these political maneuverings by some foreign, foreign countries. And I think Henry is absolutely right. When you look at the destination of investments, look at China as a whole, this is really the most dynamic and most competitive market. You have all these ingredients all concentrated in, for example, the Greater Bay Area, in the Yangtze River, and in China as a whole, in the uh, upper reaches of the Yangtze River, as well as in all other parts of China. And I think this dynamism will be continued in the coming five years and in the decades to come. This makes China really the unique place in the whole world to attract foreign investments from different parts of the world, mostly from the Western countries. And I hope this will be viewed in a positive way rather than in a negative way. Exactly. Well, Jiangsu actually, uh, Kunshan is a very good example of, uh, of another very major task and also policy of the uh, the Communist Party Central Committee, the Common Pro common Prosperity, uh, Kunshan and Zhejiang. I recently went to Zhejiang. I saw very good examples of common prosperity there, starting from small uh, seafood, very small industry, in developing into a large one, actually. Uh, common prosperity is a common pursuit of uh, not only China, but also 
the whole world. Everybody wants a fairer society. Everybody wants to see businesses developing and uh, not only take but also give back to society. Right. So what is the common prosperity plan of China? Uh, what is uh, the significance of that plan to global uh, community, to international community? Yeah, yeah, thank you. This is a great question. Actually, uh, we see from the, this representative uh, uh, the corridor just now that uh, from Chunnan in Zhejiang province. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, Zhejiang now is trying to be a, a model of China to common prosperity because that's a century or even centuries uh, uh, challenges for the mankind. How to emulate the poverty? So China actually did uh, 800 million people out of poverty, lifted 800 million out of poverty for the last four, 40 some decade, uh, for decades. But then now we, we are having another big challenge now is the how can we commonly get better off? You know, we have in the extreme poverty, how can we build a larger middle class? This is a challenge still facing by many Western countries. We can see that in the US, some Western countries, the, the, the t a tiny percentage of wealthy and mm. but equal to a probably massive the and the uh, pandemic even enlarged yeah. the gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that <laughs> the life expectancy has been shortened and mm. uh, people middle class is uh, stagnated for the last several decades. Mm. So this this actually uh, you know breeds the deglobalization and anti globalization efforts and then China often become a scapegoat. So China realized that and China now is trying to emulate mm. you know trying to create a larger middle class now. Mm. So we have a 400 million middle class. Let's have another 400 million maybe down the road. And so have a, let's have a common prosperity. So the challenge for China is to have, how can we turn a 1 billion rest of the population into middle class? I think that's common prosperity for China. And that would be a good right. exchange for the world. All right. Now let's uh, go to the Great Hall of People, where the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China is going to officially commence. And General Secretary, as we just said, the General Secretary of Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, Xi Jinping, will give the main major contents of uh, the report. Distinguished delegates, 
The 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China now officially begins. Please all rise and sing the national anthem. When we solemnly hold the 20th CPC National Congress, let us pay our tribute to the revolutionists and the proletariat, Comrade Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Liu Shaoqi, Zhu De, Deng Xiaoping, and Chen Yun and to those revolutionary martyrs, let's pay an, a, a moment of silence. Moments over. Please be seated. Distinguished delegates, the 20th CPC National Congress quorum is 2,296. And 83 specially invited delegates, and altogether the number of delegates is 2,379. And today, 39 persons have asked for temporary absence. And the total attendance is 2,340. And today, with us are also some representatives outside the parties and units. We welcome you all. Now, please allow me to invite General Secretary Xi Jinping to give a report on behalf of the 19 CPC Central Committee.
同志们 ，Comrades。现在我代表第十九届中央委员会。On behalf of the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, I will now deliver a report to the 20th National Congress. 第二十次。The 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China is a meeting of great importance. It takes place at a critical time, as the entire party and the Chinese people of all ethnic groups embark on a new journey to build China into a modern socialist country in all respects and advance towards the second centennial goal. The theme of this Congress is holding high the great banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics, fully implementing the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for new era, carrying forward the great founding spirit of the party, staying confident and building strength, upholding fundamental principles and break new ground, forging ahead with enterprise and fortitude, and strive in unity to build a modern socialist country in all respect and advance the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts. Since its founding a century ago, the Communist Party of China has taken a remarkable journey. Our party has dedicated itself to achieving lasting greatness for the Chinese nation and committed itself to the noble cause of peace and development for humanity. Our responsibility is unmatched in importance, and our mission is glorious beyond compare. It is the imperative that all of us in the party never forget our original aspiration and founding mission. That we always stay modest, prudent, and hardworking, and that we have the courage and ability to carry on our fight. We must remain confident in our history. Exhibit greater historical initiative and write an even more magnificent chapter for socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. The five years since the 19th National Congress. And the great changes in the first decade of the new era. The five years since the National Congress have been truly momentous and extraordinary. The Party Central Committee has pursued a strategy of national rejuvenation amid global changes of a magnitude not seen in a century, and made. Major strategic plan for advancing the cause of the party and the country. The Central Committee has brought together the entire party, the military, and the Chinese people, and led them in effectively responding to grave, intricate international developments. And a series of immense risks and challenges. With great effort and determination, we have steadily advanced socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. Over the past five years, we have continued to strengthen the overall leadership of the party. And the centralized, unified leadership of the Central Committee. We have devoted great energy. To finish building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we have fully and faithfully applied the new development philosophies on all fronts, focused on promoting high-quality development, and work to create a new pattern of development. We have pursued reform at a swift and steady pace. Made solid progress in developing whole process people's democracy and advanced law-based governance across all fields of endeavor. We have actively developed advanced socialist culture. We have ensured and improved public well-being as a matter of priority and pulled resources to wage a critical battle against poverty. We made big push to enhance ecological conservation. 
We have worked with firm resolve to safeguard national security, fend it off and defuse the major risks and ensure social stability. We have devoted great energy to modernizing our national defense and armed forces. We have conducted major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics on all fronts. And we have made sweeping efforts to advance the great new project of party building. We celebrated the, the centenary of the Communist Party of China and the 70th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. We adopted the third resolution concerning the party's history, organized party-wide activities to study party history, and called upon all party members to study and apply the great founding spirit of the party. In responding to the sudden outbreak of COVID-19, we put the people and their lives above all else and to necessarily pursue a dynamic zero COVID policy in launching an all out people's war to stop the spread of the virus. We have protected the people's health and safety to the greatest extent possible and made tremendous encouraging achievements in both epidemic response and economic and social development. In the face of turbulent developments in Hong Kong, the central government exercises overall jurisdiction over the special administrative regions as prescribed by China's constitution and basic law of the Hong Kong special administrative region and ensure that Hong Kong is ministered by patriots. Thanks to these moves, orders have been restored in Hong Kong making marking a major turn for the better in the region. In response to separate activities aimed at Taiwan independence and gross provocations of external interference in Taiwan affairs, we have resolutely fought against separatism and counter-interference, demonstrating our resolve and ability to safeguard China's sovereignty and territorial integrity and to oppose Taiwan independence. Confronted with drastic changes in the international landscape, we have maintained firm strategic resolve and shown a fighting spirit Throughout these endeavors, we have safeguarded China's dignity and core interest and kept ourselves well positioned for pursuing development and ensuring security. Over the past five years, our party has rallied the people and led them in solving great number of problems that had long gone unsolved, securing many accomplishments that hold major future significance and achieving impressive advances in the course of the party and the country. Comrades, 10 years have passed since the party 18th National Congress. The past decade marked three major events of great immediate importance and profound historical significance for the cause of the party and the people. We embrace the centenary of the Communist Party of China. We ushered in a new era of socialism with Chinese characteristics. And we eradicated absolute poverty and finished building a moderately prosperous society in all respects, thus completing the first centenary goal. These were historical feats, feats accomplished by the Communist Party of China 
and the Chinese people striving in unity. Feats that will be forever recorded in the Chinese nation's history and feats that will be profoundly influence the world. A decade ago, this was the situation we faced. Great achievements had been secured in reform and opening up, and socialism mobilization, and notable advances had been made in the great new projects of party building. All this had created solid foundations, favorable conditions, and key underpinning for our continued progress. At the same time, however, a number of prominent issues and problems, some of which have been building for years and others which were just emerging, demanded urgent actions. In the face of these acute problems and challenges which undermine the party's long-term governance, the security and stability of our country, and the well-being of the people, the party's central committee fully assessed the situation, made resolute decisions, and took firm steps. Under its leadership, the entire party, the military, and the Chinese people were brought together. We rolled up our leaves and got down to work, forging ahead with resolve to carry out the great struggle with many new features of our times. Over the past decade, we have stayed committed to Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of three represents, and the scientific outlook on development. We have fully implemented the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, as well as the party's basic line and the basic policy. We have adopted a number of strategic measures, developed a range of transformative practices, and made a series of breakthroughs and landmark advances. We have withstood risks and challenges and trials in the political, economic, ideological, and natural domains. Secure historical achievements and seen historical changes in the course of the party and the country, and taken China on a new journey toward building a modern socialist country in all respects. We have established thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. In doing so, we have laid out the basic policy for upholding and developing socialism with Chinese characteristics, put forward a series of new ideas, new thinkings, and new strategies on national governance, and achieved a new breakthrough in adapting Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of our times. We have strengthened party leadership in all respects. We have ensured the party central committee's authority and centralized unified leadership and guaranteed that the party fulfilled its core role of exercising overall leadership and coordinating the efforts of all sides. Now, our Marxist party of over 69 million members enjoy greater unity and solidarity than ever. We have achieved moderately prosperity, the millennia-old dream of the Chinese nation through persistent hard work. We have won the largest battle against poverty in human history, and once and for all, resolved the problem of absolute poverty in China, making significant contributions to the cause of global poverty reduction. We 
We have developed a well-conceived and complete strategic plan for advancing the cause of the party and the country in new era. We have put forward the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and made well-coordinated efforts to advance our great struggle, project, cause, and dream. We have adopted the five-sphere integrated plan and the four comprehensive strategy as well as the general principle of pursuing progress while ensuring stability, and we have worked to both pursue development and safeguard security. We have identified the principal contradiction facing Chinese society as that between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing needs for a better life. And we have made it clear that closing this gap should be the focus of all of our initiatives. With these efforts, we have made constant progress in enriching and developing a new form of human advancement. We have put forward and applied a new development philosophy, worked hard to promote high-quality development, and pushed to foster a new pattern of development. We have carried out supply-side structural reform, formulated a series of major regional strategies' importance to China's overall development and brought about historical rise in China's economic strength. In the past decade, China's GDP has grown from 55 trillion yuan to 114 trillion yuan and come to account for 18.5% of the world economy up by 7.2 percentage points. China has remained the world's second largest economy, and its per capita GDP has risen from 39,800 yuan to 81,000 yuan. It ranks first in the world in terms of grain output. China's manufacturing sectors is the largest in the world as are its foreign exchange reserves. We have made breakthroughs in some core technologies in key fields and boosted emerging strategic industries. We have witnessed major success in multiple fronts, including manned spaceflight, lunar and Martian explorations, deep sea and deep earth probes, supercomputers, satellite navigation, quantum information, nuclear power technologies, airline manufacturing, and biomedic biomedicine. China has joined the ranks of the world's innovators. We have comprehensively deepened reform with tremendous political courage, historic, his systematic, and holistic transformation have been achieved in many fields. The system of socialism with Chinese characteristics has become more mature and well-defined, and China's system and capacity for governance have been further modernized. We have pursued a more proactive strategy of opening up. As a collaborative endeavor, the Belt and Road Initiative has been welcomed by the international community both as a public goods and a cooperation platform. China has become a major trading partner for more than 140 countries and regions. It leads the world in total volume of trade in goods, and it is a major destination for global investment and the leading country in outbound investment.
Through these efforts, we have advanced a broader agenda of opening up across more areas and in greater depth. We have kept to the path of socialist post-political advancement with Chinese characteristics. We have comprehensively developed whole process people's democracy and made all-round progress in improving the institutions, standards, and procedures of our socialist democracy. We have reinforced the foundation that undergird the people's running of the country and the comprehensive framework for law-based governance has taken shape. We have established and upheld a fundamental system for ensuring the guiding role of Marxism in the ideological domain. The core socialist values are resonating with the public. Fine traditional Chinese culture is undergoing creative transformation and development. Cultural programs are flourishing, and the online environment has seen continuous improvement. All this has brought overarching and fundamental changes in China's ideological landscape. We have implemented a people-centered philosophy of development. We have worked continuously to ensure people's access to child care, education, employment, medical services, elderly care, housing, and social assistance. We have built the largest education social security, and health care systems in the world. We have ensured a more complete and lasting sense of fulfillment, happiness, and security for people. And we have made further progress in achieving common prosperity for all. We have acted on the ideas that Lucy Water and Lush Mountains are invaluable assets. We have persisted with a holistic and systematic approach to conserving and improving mountains, waters, forests, farmlands, grassland, and desert ecosystems. China's ecological conservation systems have been improved. Historic, transformative, and comprehensive changes have taken place in ecological and environmental protection, bringing us bluer skies, greener mountains, and cleaner waters. We have applied a holistic approach to national security. We have resolutely safeguarded China's sovereignty, security, and development interests and strengthened national security on all fronts. We have secured important progress in the campaigns to combat and root out organized crime and responded effectively to major natural disasters. The Peaceful China Initiative has entered a new stage. We have set the party's goal of building a strong military in the new era. We have implemented the party's thinking on strengthening the military for the new era, followed the military strategy for the new era, and upheld absolute party leadership over the People's Armed Forces. We have coordinated efforts to strengthen military work in all directions and domains and carried out bold reforms of national defense and the armed forces. The People's Armed Forces now boast new systems, a new structure, a new configuration, and a new look. We 
We have fully and faithfully implemented the policy of one country, two systems. We have upheld the policy of one country, two systems, under which the people of Hong Kong administer Hong Kong and the people of Macau administer Macau, both with a high degree of autonomy. We have helped Hong Kong enter a new stage in which it has restored order and is set to thrive, and we've seen Hong Kong and Macau maintain good momentum for long-term stability and development. We put forward an overall policy framework for resolving the Taiwan question in the new era and facilitated cross-strait exchanges and cooperation. We resolutely have opposed separatist activities aimed at Taiwan independence and foreign interference. We have thus maintained the initiative and the ability to steer in cross-strait relations. We have pursued major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics on all fronts. We have promoted the development of a human community with a shared future and stood firm in protecting international fairness and justice. We have advocated and practiced true multilateralism. We have taken a clear-cut stance against hegemonism and power politics in all their forms, and we have never wavered in our opposition to unilateralism, protectionism, and bullying of any kind. We have worked to foster a new type of international relations, actively participated in the reform and development of the global governance system, and engaged in all-around international cooperation in the fight against COVID-19. All this has seen us win widespread international recognition. China's international influence, appeal, and power to shape have risen markedly. We have made significant advances in exercising full and rigorous party self-governance, guided by the belief that it takes a good blacksmith to forge good steel. We have put forward and implemented the general requirements for strengthening the party in the new era. We have set strengthening ourselves politically as the overarching guide for all other initiatives of party building. We have hammered away at the task of rectifying pointless formalities, bureaucratism, hedonism and extravagance, and opposed privilege-seeking mindsets and practices. Thanks to these efforts, unhealthy tendencies that had long gone unchecked have been reversed, and deep-seated problems that had plagued us for years have been remedied. We have waged a battle against corruption on a scale unprecedented in our history. Driven by a strong sense of mission, we have resolved to offend a few thousand rather than fail 1.4 billion and to clear out party of all its ills. We've used a combination of measures to take out tigers, sweat flies and hunt down foxes, punishing corrupt officials of all types. We have achieved an overwhelming victory and we have fully consolidated the gains in our fight against corruption. All this has helped remove serious hidden dangers in the party, the country, and the military through painstaking efforts. The party has found a second answer to the question of how to escape the historical cycle of rise and fall. The answer is self-reform. We have ensured that the party will never change its nature, its conviction, or its character. As we fully affirm the remarkable achievements we have made in the cause of the party and the country, we must not lose sight of the shortcomings in our work and many difficulties and problems that are confronting us. We have already put in place a series of measures to deal with these problems, and we must redouble our efforts to see them fully resolved. Comrades, 
The great achievements of the new era have come from the collective dedication and hard work of our party and our people. Here, on behalf of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, I express our heartfelt gratitude to all of our party members, to the people of all ethnic groups, to all other political parties, people's organizations, and patriotic figures from all sectors of society, to our fellow compatriots in the Hong Kong and Macau Special Administrative Regions in Taiwan and overseas, and to all our friends around the world who have shown understanding and support for China's modernization drive. The great transformation over the past 10 years of the new era marks a milestone in the history of the party, of the People's Republic of China, of reform and opening up, of the development of socialism, and of the development of the Chinese nation. Over the course of a century of endeavor, the Communist Party of China has tempered itself through revolution and grown stronger, as it has upheld and developed socialism with Chinese characteristics, it has always remained a strong leadership core. The Chinese people are more inspired than ever to forge ahead, more resolved than ever to work hard, and more confident than ever of securing success. With full confidence, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese people are driving the great transformation of the Chinese nation from standing up and growing prosperous to becoming strong. We have advanced reform, opening up, and socialist modernization, and the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation is now on an irreversible historical course. Scientific socialism is brimming with renewed vitality in the 21st century China. Chinese modernization offers humanity a new choice for achieving modernization. The Communist Party of China and the Chinese people have provided humanity with more Chinese insight, better Chinese input, and greater Chinese strength to help resolve its common challenges, and have made new and greater contributions to the noble cause of human peace and development. Second, a new frontier in adapting Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of the times. Marxism is the fundamental guiding ideology upon which our party and our country are founded and thrive. Our experience has taught us that at the fundamental level, we owe the success of our party and socialism with Chinese characteristics to the fact that Marxism works, particularly when it is adapted to the Chinese context and the needs of our times. The sound theoretical guidance of Marxism is the source from which our party draws its firm belief and conviction, and which enables our party to seize the historical initiative. Since the 18th National Congress, 
Our party has made theoretical explorations and innovations with great courage. It has, from an entirely new perspective, deepened its understanding of the laws that underlie governance by a communist party, the development of socialism, and the evolution of human society. It has achieved major theoretical innovations, which are encapsulated in the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. The main elements of the theory are summarized in the 10 affirmations, the 14 commitments, and the 13 areas of achievement that were articulated at the 19th National Congress and the 6th Plenary Session of the 19th Party Central Committee, all of which we must adhere to over the long term and continue to enrich and develop. Chinese communists are keenly aware that only by integrating the basic tenets of Marxism with China's specific realities and fine traditional culture, and only by applying dialectical and historical materialism can we provide correct answers to the major questions presented by the times and discovered through practice, and can we ensure that Marxism always retains its vigor and vitality? Just as there are no bounds to practice, there is no end to theoretical innovation. It is the solemn historical responsibility of today's Chinese communists to continue opening new chapters in adapting Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of the times. To keep advancing theoretical innovation on the basis of practical experience, we must, first of all, gain a good command of the worldview and methodology of the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, and adhere to and make good use of its stances, viewpoints, and methods. We must put the people first, maintain self-confidence, and stand on our own feet, uphold fundamental principles, and break new ground, adopt a problem-oriented approach, apply systematic thinking, and maintain a global vision. We must stand firmly with the people, respond to their wishes, respect their creativity, and pull their wisdom. We must remain firm in our conviction in Marxism and socialism with Chinese characteristics, and strengthen our confidence in the path, theory, system, and culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics. We must keep developing new thinking, new approaches, and new ways to effectively resolve problems. And we must develop a well-conceived approach to planning and advancing the endeavors of the party and the country on all fronts in a forward-looking and holistic manner. Third, the new journey of the new era, missions and tasks of the Communist Party of China. From this day forward, the central task of the Communist Party of China will be to lead the Chinese people of all ethnic groups in a concerted effort to realize the second centenary goal of building China into a great modern socialist country in all respects, and to advance the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts through a Chinese path to modernization. Chinese modernization is socialist modernization pursued under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. It contains elements that are common to the modernization processes of all countries, but it's more characterized by features that are unique to the Chinese context. 
It is the modernization of a huge population. The modernization of common prosperity for all. The modernization of material and cultural ethical advancement. The modernization of harmony between humanity and nature, and the modernization of peaceful development. The essential requirements of Chinese modernization are as follows. Upholding the leadership of the Communist Party of China and socialism with Chinese characteristics. Pursuing high-quality development, developing whole process people's democracy, enriching the people's cultural lives, achieving common prosperity for all, promoting harmony between humanity and nature, building a human community with a shared future, and creating a new form of human advancement. To build China into a great modern socialist country in all respects, we have adopted a two-step strategic plan. From 2020 through 2035, basically realize socialist modernization. From 2035 through the middle of this century, build China into a great modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. The next five years will be crucial for getting our efforts to build a modern socialist country in all respects off to a good start. Building a modern socialist country in all respects is a great and arduous endeavor. Our future is bright, but we still have a long way to go. We must therefore be more mindful of potential dangers. Be prepared to deal with worst-case scenarios and be ready to withstand high winds, choppy waters, and even dangerous storms on our journey ahead, which might be the major challenges. And on our journey ahead, we must firmly adhere to the following major principles. Upholding and strengthening the party's overall leadership, following the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics, applying a people-centered development philosophy, remaining committed to deepening reform and opening up, and carrying forward our fighting spirit. We must foster a firmer sense of purpose fortitude and self-belief in the whole party and the Chinese people, so that we cannot be swayed by fallacies, deterred by intimidation, or cowed by pressure. We must meet obstacles and difficulties head-on, ensure both development and security, and dig deep to surmount the difficulties and challenges on the road ahead. Let us harness our indomitable fighting spirit to open up new horizons for our cause. Fourth, accelerating the creation of a new development pattern and pursuing high-quality development. To build a modern socialist country in all respects, we must first and foremost pursue high-quality development. Development is our party's top priority in governing and rejuvenating China, for without solid material and technological foundations, we cannot hope to build a great modern socialist country in all respects.
We must fully and faithfully apply the new development philosophy on our fronts, continue reforms to develop the socialist market economy, promote high standard opening up, and accelerate efforts to foster a new pattern of development that is focused on the domestic economy and features positive interplay between domestic and international economic flows. Pursuing high-quality development as our overarching task, we will make sure that our implementation of the strategy to expand domestic demand is integrated with our efforts to deepen supply-side structural reform. We will boost the dynamism and reliability of the domestic economy while engaging at a higher level in the global economy. And we will move faster to build a modernized economy. We will raise total factor productivity, make China's industrial and supply chains more resilient and secure and promote integrated urban-rural development and coordinated regional development so as to effectively upgrade and appropriately expand China's economic output. We will build a high standard socialist market economy. We must uphold and improve China's basic socialist economic system we must unswervingly consolidate and develop the public sector and unswervingly encourage, support and guide development of the non-public sector. We will work to see that the market plays the decisive role in resource allocation and that the government better plays its role. We will modernize the industrial system in pursuing economic growth we must continue to focus on the real economy. We will advance new industrialization and move faster to boost China's strength in manufacturing, product quality, aerospace, transportation, cyberspace, and digital development. We will advance rural revitalization across the board. We we'll continue to put agriculture and rural development first and consolidate to expand our achievements in poverty alleviation. We we'll move fast to build up China's strength in agriculture and steadily promote the revitalization of business, talents, culture, ecosystems, and organizations in the countryside. We must reinforce the foundations for food security and on all fronts and ensure China's total area of farmland does not fall below the red line of 120 million hectares. With these efforts, we we'll ensure that China's food supply remains firmly in its own hands. We will promote coordinated regional development. We will thoroughly implement the coordinated regional development strategy, major regional strategies, the functional zoning strategy, and the new urbanization strategy. We will improve the distribution of the major productive forces and develop a regional economic layout and territorial space system that complement each other's strengths and promote high quality development. We will promote high standard opening up. We will steadily expand institutional opening up with regards to rules, regulations, management and standards and accelerate China's transformation into a trader of quality we will promote the high quality development of the Belt and Road Initiative and endeavor to preserve the diversity and stability of the international economic landscape and economic and trade relations. Five, invigorating China through science and education and developing a strong workforce for the modernization drive. Education science and technology and human resources are the fundamental and strategic pillars for building a modern socialist country in all respects. We must regard science and technology as our primary productive force, talent as our primary resource, 
and innovation as our primary driver of growth. We will fully implement a strategy for invigorating China through science and education, the workforce development strategy, and the innovation-driven development strategy. We will open up new areas and new arenas in development and steadily foster new growth drivers and new strengths. We will continue to give high priority to the development of education, build China's self-reliance and strengthen science technology and rely on talent to pioneer, to propel development. We will speed up work to build a strong educational system, greater scientific and technological strengths and a quality workforce. We continue efforts to cultivate talents for the party and the country and comprehensively improve our ability to nurture talent at home. All of this will see us producing first-class innovators and attracting the brightest minds from all over. We will develop education that meets the people's expectations. We will fully implement the party's educational policy, carry out the basic tasks of fostering virtues through education, and nurture a new generation of capable young people with sound moral grounding, intellectual property, physical vigor, athletic sensitivity, and work skills, who fully develop socialism would carry forward a social cause. We we'll move faster to build a high-quality educational system, advance students' well-rounded development, and promote fairness in education. We will improve systems for scientific and technological innovation. Innovation will remain at the heart of China's modernization drive. We will improve the new systems for mobilizing resources nationwide and make key technological breakthroughs and boost China's strengths in strategic science and technology. We will enhance the overall performance of China's innovation system and create an open and globally competitive innovation ecosystem. We will accelerate the implementation of the innovation-driven development strategy. We will speed up efforts to achieve greater self-reliance and strengthen science and technology. To meet China's strategic needs, we will con concentrate resources on original and pioneering scientific and technological research to achieve breakthroughs in core technologies in key fields. In order to enhance China's innovation capacity, we will move faster to launch a number of major national projects that are of strategic big picture and long-term importance. We will implement the workforce development strategy, which respect work, knowledge, talent, and creativity, improve the strategic distribution of human resources, and move faster to build world hubs for talents and innovation. We will strive to build up our comparative strengths in global competition for talent and bring together the best and the brightest from all fields for the cause of the party and people. Six. Advancing the whole process, people's democracy, and ensuring that the people run the country. China is a socialist country, a people's democratic dictatorship under the leadership of the working class based on alliance of workers and farmers. All power of the state in China belongs to the people. People's democracy is the lifeblood of socialism, and it is integral to our efforts to build a modern socialist country in all respects. Whole process people's democracy is the defining feature of socialist democracy. It is democracy in its broadest, most genuine, and most effective form. We must firmly stay on the path of socialism political advancement with Chinese characteristics, uphold the unity between party leadership, the running of the country by the people, and law-based governance, and ensure the principal position of the people so as to give full expression 
to their will, protect their rights and interests, and spark their creativity. We will improve the system of institutions through which the people around the country will encourage the people orderly participation in political affairs and guarantee the ability to engage in democratic election, consultation, decision making, management, and oversight in accordance with the law. We will inspire the people's motivation, initiatives, and creativity so as to consolidate and develop a lively, stable, and united political atmosphere. We will strengthen the institutions through which the people run the country. We must uphold and improve our country's fundamental, basic, and important political systems, expand democratic channels, and diversify the forms of democracy. We will support and ensure that people's exercise of state power through people's congresses. We will intensify reform and development of trade unions, Chinese Communist Youth League organizations, women's federations, and other people's organizations and give full play to their role as bridges connecting the party and the people. We will follow the Chinese path of human rights development and promote all-round advancement of human rights. We will fully develop a consultative democracy. We will promote extensive, multi-level, and institutionalized development of consultative democracy. We will uphold the improved system of CPC-led multi-party cooperation and political consultation and work to improve the system of mechanism through which CPPCC committees conduct democratic oversight and the members stay engaged with the people from various sectors. We will actively develop a democracy at the primary level. We will improve the mechanism for community-level self-governance under the leadership of primary-level party organizations, improve the institutional and working systems for direct democracy at the primary level. We will rely wholeheartedly on the working class and protect workers' lawful rights and interests. We will consolidate and develop the broadest possible patriotic united front. We will build a broad united front to forge great unity and solidarity. And we will encourage all the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation to dedicate themselves to realizing the Chinese dreams of national rejuvenation. We will strengthen our party's unity and cooperation with other political parties and prominent figures without party affiliation. We will forge a strong sense of community for the Chinese nation and improve the party's work on ethnic affairs. We will remain committed to the principle that religions in China must be Chinese in orientation and provide active guidance to religions so that they can adapt to socialist society. We will improve and strengthen our work related to the Chinese nationals overseas to give shape to a powerful joint force to advance the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Seven, exercising law-based governance on all fronts and advancing the rule of law in China. The comprehensive advancement of law-based governance has been a profound revolution in China's governance. Law-based governance is important for the party's success in governing and rejuvenating the country, for the well-being of the people, and for the long-term stability of the party and the country. We must give better play to the role of the rule of law in consolidating foundations, ensuring stable expectations, and delivering long-term benefits. We must strive to build a modern socialist country in all respects under the rule of law. We must follow a path of socialist rule of law with Chinese characteristics, develop a Chinese system of socialist rule of law, and establish China as a socialist country under the rule of law. We must 
With a focus on protecting and promoting social fairness and justice, pursue coordinated progress in law-based governance, law-based exercise of state power, and law-based government administration take integral steps to build a country, government, and the society based on rule of law. We make all-round efforts to ensure sound legislation, strict law enforcement, impartial administration of justice, and society-wide observation of the law, and see that all work in the state is carried out under the rule of law. We improve the socialist legal system with Chinese characteristics with the Constitution at its core. We will better implement the Constitution and conduct constitutional oversight. We will step up in legislation in key emerging and foreign-related fields and make further headway in making laws in a well-conceived and democratic way and in accordance with the law. We steadily advance law-based government administration, we will transform government functions, improve the government responsibility system, and organizational structures, and enhance the efficiency and credibility of government administrations. We will ensure that law enforcement is strict, procedure-based, and impartial and civil across the board. We will ensure strict and impartial administration justice. We will deepen the comprehensive integrated reform of the judicial system, fully and faithfully enforce judicial accountability, and accelerate the development of fair, efficient, and authoritative socialist judicial system. We will see that the people feel justice have been served in each and every judicial case. We will step up our efforts to establish the rule of law throughout society, promote socialist rule of law, and carry forward the fine traditional Chinese legal culture. We will encourage all of our people to truly revere, readily observe, and firmly defend socialist rule of law, and see that respecting, learning, observing, and applying the law become common practice throughout society. Eight, building cultural confidence and strength and securing new successes in developing socialist culture. To build a modern socialist country in all respects, we must develop a socialist culture with Chinese characteristics and be more confident in our culture. In our efforts to turn China into a country with a strong socialist culture, we must focus on upholding socialism with Chinese characteristics, rallying public support, fostering a new generation of young people, developing Chinese culture, and better present China to the world. We will develop a sound, people-oriented socialist culture for a nation that embraces modernization of the world and the future. We will ignite the cultural creativity of the entire nation and build a powerful source of inspiration for realizing national rejuvenation. We should uphold the fundamental system for ensuring the guiding role of Marxism in the ideological domain. We must ensure that culture serves the people and serves socialism. We will follow the principle of letting a hundred flowers blossom and a hundred schools of thoughts content, and we will encourage creative transformation and innovative development of traditional Chinese culture. Guided by coarse socialist values, we will develop advanced socialist culture, promote revolutionary culture, and carry forward fine traditional Chinese culture. In doing so, we will be well placed to meet people's ever-growing intellectual and cultural needs, consolidate a common intellectual foundation for the whole party and all Chinese people to strive in unity and we will continuously grow China's cultural soft power and the appeal of Chinese culture. 
We will develop a socialist ideology that has the power to unite and inspire the people. We must ensure that the party firmly exercises leadership over ideological work and that the responsibility system for it is fully implemented. And we will cement and expand the mainstream thoughts and ideas that inspire hard work in the new era. We will improve the systems for communications across all forms of media and foster a healthy online environment. We will extensively apply the core socialist values. We will carry forward the long line of inspiring principles for the Chinese communists that originated with the great founding spirit of the party. Conduct extensive public awareness activities to promote the core socialist values. Enhance commitment to patriotism, collectivism, and socialism, and foster a new generation of young people to shoulder the mission of realizing national rejuvenation. We will enhance civility throughout society. We will continue the civic morality campaign, carry forward traditional Chinese virtues, and foster stronger family ties, values, and traditions. We will build public commitment to the greater good, public morality, and personal integrity. These efforts will help raise public moral standards and enhance public civility. We will foster an ethos of work, enterprise, dedication, creativity, and frugality throughout the society. We will develop cultural programs and the cultural sector. We will encourage people-centered cultural creation and production of more outstanding works that inspire the people. We will improve the modern system of public cultural services and implement major cultural projects to spur the development of the sector. We will promote all-around the development of recreational and competitive sports and move faster to build China into a country strong in sports. We will extend the reach and appeal of Chinese civilization. We will stay firmly rooted in Chinese culture, and we will better tell China's stories, make China's voice heard, and present a China that is credible, appealing, and respectable. And we will better show the world China's culture. Nine, improving the people's well-being and raising quality of life. This country is its people. The people are the country. As the Communist Party of China has led the people in fighting against to establish and develop the People's Republic. It has really been fighting for people's support, and bringing benefit to the people is the fundamental principle of governance. Working for the people's well-being is an essential part of the party's commitment to serving the public good and exercising governance for the people. We must ensure and improve the people's well-being in the course of pursuing development and encourage everyone to work hard together to meet people's aspirations for a better life. We must strive to realize, safeguard, and advance the fundamental interests of all our people. To this end, we must do everything within our capacity to resolve the most practical problems that are of the greatest and most direct concern to the people. We will stay engaged with our people and their commitments, adopt more measures that deliver real benefits to the people and win their appeal approval. 
and work hard to resolve the pressing difficulties and problems that concern them most. We will improve the basic public service system to raise public service standards and make public services more balanced and accessible so that with those efforts, we could achieve solid progress in promoting common prosperity. We will improve the system of income distribution. We will keep distribution according to work as the mainstay with multiple forms of distribution existing alongside it. We will ensure more pay for more work and encourage people to achieve prosperity through hard work. We will promote equality of opportunity, increase the incomes of low-income earners, and expand the size of the middle-income group. We will keep income distribution and the means of accumulating wealth well regulated. We will implement the Employment First strategy. We will intensify efforts to implement the Employment First policy, refine the public services system for employment, and do more to help those in difficulty find employment and meet their basic needs. We will eliminate unjustified restrictions and discrimination that undermine equal employment. In this way, we will ensure that everyone has the opportunity to pursue a career through hard work. We will improve the social security system. We will further improve the multi-tiered social security system that covers the entire population in urban and rural areas and see that it is fair, unified, reliable, well-regulated and sustainable. We will expand the coverage of social insurance programs. We will remain committed to the fundamental national policy of gender equality, protect the lawful rights and interests of women and children, and promote all-around development of programs for people with disabilities. We will move faster to build a housing system featuring multiple suppliers and various channels of support that encourages both housing rentals and purchases. We will advance the Healthy China Initiative. We must give strategic priority to ensuring people's health. We will establish a policy system to boost birth rates and pursue a proactive national strategy in response to population aging. We will promote the preservation and innovative development of traditional Chinese medicine. We will improve the public health system and strengthen the systems for epidemic prevention, control, and treatment, as well as our emergency response capacity so as to effectively contain major infectious diseases. Ten, pursuing green development and promoting harmony between humanity and nature. Nature provides the basic conditions for human survival and development, respecting, adapting to, and protecting nature is essential for building China into a modern socialist country in all respects. We must uphold and act on the principle that lucid waters and lush mountains are invaluable assets, and we must remember to maintain harmony between humanity and nature when planning our development. We will advance the Beautiful China Initiative and take a holistic and systematic approach to the conservation and improvement of mountains, waters, forests, farmlands, grasslands and deserts. We will carry out coordinated industrial restructuring, pollution control, ecological conservation, and climate response, and we will promote concerted efforts to cut carbon emissions, reduce pollution, expand green development, and pursue economic growth. We will prioritize ecological protection, conserve resources, and use them efficiently, and pursue green and low-carbon development. 
We will accelerate the transition to a model of green development. We will implement a comprehensive conservation strategy, boost green and low-carbon industries, encourage green consumption, and promote green and low-carbon ways of production and life. We will intensify pollution prevention and control. We will make further efforts to keep our skies blue, waters clear, and lands clean. We will work to basically eliminate serious air pollution, generally eliminate black and malodorous water bodies in cities, and strengthen prevention and control of soil contamination at the source. The environmental infrastructure will be upgraded, and living environments in both urban and rural areas will be improved. We will enhance diversity, stability, and sustainability in our ecosystems. Major projects for preserving and restoring key ecosystems will be carried out at a faster pace. We will carry out major biodiversity protection projects, promote the natural regeneration of grasslands, forests, rivers, lakes, and wetlands, enforce the 10-year fishing ban on the Yangtze River, and improve the system of fallowing and crop rotation. Efforts will be made to prevent and treat harm caused by invasions of exotic species. We will work actively and prudently toward the goals of reaching peak carbon emissions and carbon neutrality. Based on China's energy and resource endowment, we will advance initiatives to reach peak carbon emissions in a well-planned and phased way, in line with the principle of building the new before discarding the old. We will thoroughly advance the energy revolution. Coal will be used in a cleaner and more efficient way, and will speed up the planning and development of a system for new energy sources, and we will get actively involved in global governance in response to climate change. Eleven, modernizing China's national security system and capacity, and safeguarding national security and social stability. National security is the bedrock of national rejuvenation, and social stability is a prerequisite for building a strong and prosperous China. We must resolutely pursue a holistic approach to national security and promote national security in all areas and stages of the work of the party and the country so as to ensure national security and social stability. We must take the people's security as our utmost goal, political security as our fundamental task, economic security as our foundation, military, technological, cultural and social security as important pillars, and international security as a support. We will take coordinated steps to ensure external and internal security, homeland and public security, traditional and non-traditional security, and our own security and common security. We will both uphold national security and create the conditions for ensuring it. We will strengthen popular support for national security and social stability, improve the mechanisms for our participation in global security governance, and advance the Peaceful China initiative to a higher level. With this new security architecture, we'll be able to better safeguard China's new pattern of development. We will improve the national security system. We will work to ensure that our leadership system for national security is high-performing and authoritative. Improvements will be made in the legal, strategy, and policy systems for national security, as well as the risk monitoring and early warning systems, and the national emergency management system. We will create a coordinated, multidimensional, and highly effective system for protecting national security across all domains. We will strengthen our capacity for safeguarding national security. We will resolutely safeguard the security of China's state power, systems, and ideology. We will ensure 
the security of food, energy and resources as well as key industrial and supply chains. We will protect the lawful rights and interests of Chinese citizens and legal entities overseas and strengthen the public line of defense. We will enhance public safety governance. We will follow the principles of putting safety first and placing emphasis on prevention. The public safety system will be improved and we will enhance our capacity for disaster prevention, mitigation and relief and for responding to and providing support during public emergencies that are urgent, difficult, dangerous and demanding. Protection of personal information will be strengthened. We will improve the social governance system. We will improve the social governance system based on collaboration, participation and shared benefits so as to make social governance more effective. We will maintain open and regular channels for learning about people's concerns, handling their claims, and protecting their rights and interests. We will foster a community of social governance in which everyone fulfills their responsibilities and shares in the benefits. Twelve, achieving the centenary goal of the People's Liberation Army and further modernizing national defense and the military. Achieving the goals for the centenary of the People's Liberation Army in 2027 and more quickly elevating our people's armed forces to world-class standards are strategic tasks for building a modern socialist country in all respects. To this end, we must apply the thinking on strengthening the military for the new era, implement the military strategy for the new era, and maintain the party's absolute leadership over the people's armed forces. We will continue to enhance political loyalty in the military, strengthen the military through reform, science and technology, and personnel training, and run the military in accordance with the law. We will work faster to modernize military theory, organizational forms, personnel, and weaponry and equipment. We will enhance the military's strategic capabilities for defending China's sovereignty, security and development interests and see that the People's Armed Forces effectively fulfill their missions and tasks in the new era. We will strengthen party building across the board in the People's Armed Forces to ensure that they always obey the party's command. We will improve the institutions and mechanisms for implementing the system of ultimate responsibility resting with the chairman of the Central Military Commission. We will strengthen party organizations in the People's Armed Forces, carry out regular activities and put in place institutions to improve the military's political work, and make unremitting efforts to improve conduct, enforce discipline and combat corruption in the military. We will intensify troop training and enhance combat preparedness across the board. We'll see that our armed forces can fight and win. We'll provide new military strategic guidance and develop strategies and tactics for a people's war. We'll establish a strong system of strategic deterrence, increase the proportion of new domain forces with new combat capabilities, and intensify military training under combat conditions. We will strengthen all around military governance. We will build on and expand the gains of national defense and military reform, improve the structure and composition of the armed forces, and refine the framework of military policies and institutions. We will implement major projects to develop defense-related science and technology, weaponry and equipment and build a strong system for training new types of military personnel. We will strengthen mechanism and strategy planning for running the armed forces in accordance with the law. We will consolidate and enhance integrated rational strategies 
and strategic capabilities. We will step up capacity building in science, technology, and industries related to national defense. We will improve our national defense mobilization capacity and develop our reserve forces. Better service support will be provided to ex-service personnel. We will consolidate and boost unity between the military and the government and between the military and the people. 13. Upholding and improving the policy of one country, two systems and promoting national reunification. The policy of one country, two systems is a great innovation of socialism with Chinese characteristics. It has been proven to be the best institutional arrangement for ensuring sustained prosperity and stability in Hong Kong and Macau after their return to the motherland. This policy must be adhered to over to the long term. We will fully, faithfully and resolutely implement the policy of one country, two system, under which the people of Hong Kong and Mr. Hong Kong and the people of Macau and Mr. Macau, both with a high degree of autonomy. We will remain committed to law-based governance in Hong Kong and Macau. We will ensure that central government exercise overall jurisdiction over the two regions and see that Hong Kong and Macau are administered by patriots. We will support Hong Kong and Macau in growing their economies, improving their people's lives, and resolving deep-seated issues and problems in economic and social development so as to promote long-term prosperity and stability there. We will support Hong Kong and Macau in better integrating themselves into China's overall development and playing a greater role in realizing national rejuvenation. We will implement our party's overall policy for resolving the Taiwan question in a new era and unswervingly advance the cause of national reunification. We have always shown respect and care for our Taiwan compatriots and work to deliver benefits to them. We will continue to promote economic and social social and cultural exchanges and cooperation across the street and encourage people on both sides of the street to work together to promote Chinese culture and forge closer bounds. Resolving the Taiwan question is a matter for the Chinese, a matter that must be resolved by the Chinese. We will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and the utmost effort, but we will never promise to renounce the use of force and we reserve the option of taking all measures necessary. This is directly solely at interference by outside forces and a few separatists seeking Taiwan independence and their separatist activity is by no means targeted at our Taiwan compatriots. The wheels of history are rolling on towards China's reunification and the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Complete reunification of our country must be realized and it can without a doubt be realized. Fourteen, promoting world peace and development and building a humane community with a shared future. Today, our world, our times and history are changing in ways like never before. And this 
is posing unprecedented challenges for human society. The world has once again reached a crossroad in history, and its future course will be decided by all the world's peoples. For its part, China has been committed to its foreign policy goals of upholding world peace and promoting common development, and it is dedicated to promoting human community with a shared future. China remains firm in pursuing an independent foreign policy of peace. It has always decided its position policy on issues based on its own merits and has strived to uphold the basic norms governing international relations and safeguard international fairness and justice. China stands firmly against all forms of hegemonism and power politics and Cold War mentality, interference in other countries' internal affairs, and double standards. China will never seek hegemony or engage in expansionism. China adhered to the five principles of peaceful coexistence in pursuing friendship and cooperation with other countries. It is committed to promoting a new type of international relations, deepening and expanding global partnerships based on equality, openness and cooperation, and broadening the convergence of interests with other countries. Guided by the principles of sincerity, real results, affinity and good faith with a commitment to the greater goods and shared interest, China endeavors to strengthen the solidarity and cooperation with other developing countries. China is committed to its fundamental national policy opening up to the outside world and pursues a mutually beneficial strategy of opening up. It strives to create new opportunities for the world with its own development and to contribute its share to build an open global economy that delivers greater benefits to all peoples. China adhered to the right course of economic globalization. It is committed to working with other countries to foster an international environment conducive to development and create new drivers for global growth. China plays an active part in the reform and development of global governance system. It upholds true multilateralism, promotes greater democracy in international relations, and work to make global governance fairer and more equitable. China has put forward the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative, and it stands ready to work with the international community to put these two initiatives into action. We sincerely call upon all countries to hold dear humanity's shared values of peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom and to promote mutual understanding and forge closer bounds with other people. Let us all join forces to all meet all types of global challenges. The Chinese people are ready to work hand in hand with people across the world to create an even brighter future for humanity. Fifteen, exercising full and rigorous self-governance and advancing the great new project of party building in a new era. Our party has the pivotal role in building China into a modern socialist country in all respects and advancing the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts. As the largest and Marxist governing party of the world, we must always stay alert and determined to tackle the special challenges that a large party like ours faces so as to maintain the people's support and consolidate our position as a long-term governing party. All of us in the party must bear in mind that full and rigorous self-governance in the uncensoring endeavor and that self-reform is a journey to which there is no end. We must never slacken our efforts and never allow ourselves to become weary 
or beating. We must preserve with full and rigorous self-governance, continue to advance the brand new project of part building in a new era, and use our own transformation to steer social transformation. We must meet the overall requirement for part building in a new era, improve the systems for exercising full and rigorous self-governance, and comprehensively advance our efforts to purify, improve, renew, and excel ourselves. This will enable our party to stay true to its original aspiration and founding mission and remain the strong leadership core in building socialism with Chinese characteristics. We must uphold and strengthen the centralized, unified, unified leadership of the Party Central Committee. We improve the leadership system by which the party exercises overall leadership and coordinate the efforts of all sides and refine the mechanism through which the Party Central Committee's major decisions and plans are implemented. This will ensure that all party members closely follow the Central Committee's in terms of political stance, or orientation, principles, and path in the party, solidarity and unity are maintained, will enhance cohesion and force the party so with the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, we will make all-round efforts to strengthen ourselves theoretically, we will strengthen the ideals and conviction of our party members and see that they are committed to the party's purpose. And we will remain firm believers and loyal practitioners of the noble ideal of communism and common ideal of socialism with Chinese characteristics. We will improve the systems and regulations for the party's self-reform. We will continue to run the party with systems and regulations. We will improve the total coverage, authoritative, and highly effective oversight system under the party's unified leadership. We'll see that political inspections serve as a powerful tool, and we will work to ensure that political responsibility for full and rigorous party self-governance is fulfilled and that accountability mechanisms have real teeth. We will cultivate officials capable of shouldering the mission of national rejuvenation. We must select officials on the basis of both integrity and ability, with greater weight given to integrity and on the basis of merit regardless of background. We'll follow the right approach to selecting and appointing officials, select those who are higher caliber, professional, loyal, upright, and responsible, and ensure that strong and competent leadership teams are put in place at all levels. We will redouble our efforts to build the fighting spirit and ability of officials, and encourage officials to boldly take on responsibilities and demonstrate enterprise in their work. We will enhance the political and organizational functions of party organizations. In strengthening party organizations, we need to keep a clear focus on the primary level and see that primary level party organizations play a key role in ensuring the exercise of the party's leadership. We will motivate party members to become role models and will work to preserve their advanced nature and integrity. We will take strict steps to improve party conduct and enforce party discipline. We will steadfastly implement the central party leadership's eight-point decision on improving conduct and continue to tackle pointless formalities, bureaucratism, hiddenism and extravagance with a focus on the first two and we will resolutely root out privilege-seeking mindsets and behavior. We will endeavor to win the tough and protracted battle against corruption. Corruption is a cancer to the vitality and ability of the party, and fighting corruption is the most thorough kind of self-reform there is. As long as the breeding grounds and conditions for corruption still exist, we must keep sounding the bongo and never rest, not even for a minute, in our fight against the corruption. We will continue to make integrated efforts to ensure that officials do not have the audacity, opportunity or desire to become corrupt, and we have zero tolerance and no mercy in them.
Comrades, the times are calling us, and the people expect us to deliver. Only by pressing ahead with unwavering commitment and pers- perseverance will we be able to answer the call of our times and meet the expectations of our people. All of us in the party must remember. Upholding the party's overall leadership is the path we must take to uphold and develop socialism with Chinese characteristics. Building socialism with Chinese characteristics is the path we must take to realize the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Striving in unity is the path the Chinese people must take to create great historic achievements. Implementing the new development philosophy is the path China must take to grow stronger in the new era. And exercising full and rigorous self-governance is the path the party must take to maintain its vigor and pass new tests on the road ahead. We have to come to this understanding through many years of practices that are very critical to all of us. So. They are of paramount importance that we must cherish, uphold, and never deviate from. Under its guidance, we will ensure that the great ship of socialism with Chinese characteristics can catch the wind, cut through the waves, and sail steadily into the future. Unity is strength, and only in unity can we succeed. To build China into a modern socialist country in all respects, we must unleash the tremendous creativity of the Chinese people in their hundreds of millions. All of us in the party must stay true to our fundamental purpose of serving the people wholeheartedly, maintain a people-centered mindset, and carry out the mass line. We must respect the pioneering spirit of our people and ensure that we are acting for the people and relying on the people in everything we do. We must follow the principle of from the people to the people, maintain a close bond with the people, and accept people's criticism and oversight. We must breathe the same air as the people, share the same future, and stay truly connected to them. We must strengthen the great unity of the Chinese people of all ethnic groups and the great unity of all the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation at home and abroad. By doing so, we will create a powerful collective force working with one heart and one mind to realize the Chinese dream. A nation will prosper only when its young people thrive. China's young people of today are living in a remarkable time. They have an incomparable broad stage on which to display their full talents, and they have incomparable bright prospects of realizing their dreams. All of us in the party should regard our work concerning young people as a matter of strategic significance. We will equip young people with the party's theories, inspire them with the party's original aspiration and founding mission, and become their confidants, advocates, and guides for the future. Young people, you should steadfastly follow the party and its guidance. Aim high, but stay grounded. Dare to think big and take action, but make sure you can deliver. You should strive to be the new era's great young generation, a generation with ideals, a sense of responsibility, grit, and dedication. As you endeavor to build China into a modern socialist country in all respects, your youth and vitality will bloom in full splendor. Comrades, the party has made spectacular achievements through its great endeavors over the past century, and our new endeavors will surely lead to more spectacular achievements. Let the whole party 
the entire military and the Chinese people of all ethnic groups stay closely rallied around the party central committee. Let us keep in mind that empty talk will do nothing for our country. Only solid work will make it flourish. Let's maintain firm confidence, unite as one, and forge ahead with resolve. Let us strive in unity to build a modern socialist country in all respects and advance national rejuvenation on all fronts. Fellow delegates, just then, President Xi Jinping, on behalf of the 19th Central Committee, delivered a report. So, fellow delegates, please deliberate the report. Now we conclude the session. was the opening session of the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China and Xi Jinping delivered a report. He first uh, called on all members of the CPC to strive in unity to build a modern socialist China uh, in all respects. That's actually also the theme of uh, the 20th National Congress of the CPC. And he then uh, uh, reviewed the past five years of achievements and also the vigorous and extraordinary developments during the past 10 years since the 18th National Congress mm. of CPC. And he also thoroughly analyzed the, the situation and also the challenges both at home and abroad. And he said the next five years were crucial for good start of uh, China's uh, modernization drive. And uh, he formulated on that basis uh, programs of uh, action and also major policies and made plans and also arrangements uh, on that, uh, such as uh, accelerate creating new development pattern, pursue high quality development, mm. adopting whole process people's uh, democracy, right. enhancing innovation and always be people-centered. He stressed that quite a lot. And the, the drafting of this report has uh, gone through some very thorough, a lot of thorough surveys mm. and uh, uh, opinions of over nearly 5,000 people have been solicited. Indeed, a lot to uh, digest now. And mm. for more insights, uh, let's talk to Mr. Wang Huya and Mr. Mm. Vic Gao in our studio. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Gao. In the report, um, of course, it looks back at the achievements made in the past five years or even the past 10 years. Um, actually, it mentioned that uh, three major tasks were achieved by the CPC in the past 10 years. One is to celebrate 100th anniversary of the founding of the party. And second is the socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered a new era, of course. And um, the third one is uh, to uh, gain victory in uh, uh, eradicating absolute poverty in China and eventually establishing a moderately prosperous society. So uh, what do these uh, achievements tell about the very feature 
of the new era so far? Well, I think Xi Jinping made a very important speech which lasted about 105 minutes in total and he touched upon almost all aspects of the major challenges and opportunities that China was faced with over the past five years or even ten years and then he outlined what China need to do going forward. He not only talked about issues and the situation within the Communist Party of China but also CPC and China as a whole as well as CPC and China versus the rest of the world. So it's a very macro and very thorough, very profound analysis of the situation in the past five years at present and projecting forward into the future. I think the delegates will now sit down and analyze the contents of the speech as well as putting in their own inputs into how CPC Central Committee will eventually formulate the macro policies going forward. So I think this will be the guideline for what the CPC will do and what China will do for the coming five years. Mm. So what about the features uh, uh, according to your observation and interpretation uh, to the report for the past five and even ten years? Well, as uh, Xi Jinping mentioned, the, far, uh, the past five years uh, were very uh, crucial and uh, very challenging years because you were talking about the almost five years of the pandemic and China's dynamic zero, dyna zero uh, COVID policy, as well as China's economy entering into profound transformation, facing the headwinds caused by several countries in the West. And then uh, demographic changes in China is fast changing, as well as the aging population, and also migration of people from rural areas into the urban areas, which really ushered in lots of opportunities and challenges in terms of employment, etc. And then, as Xi Jinping emphasized on several occasions, that is, the people in China really desire better lives, and they have continuously redefined priorities, and the CPC as well as China as a whole need to do our best to satisfy these newly arisen desires or requests or requirements, for example. This keeps China very dynamic and we need to leave no stone unturned in coming up with new ways and new uh, systems of doing things. And all this cannot be done without keeping CPC clean as uh, Xi Jinping emphasized by fighting against corruption of all kinds and always rejuvenating CPC at the very top as well as throughout the hierarchy so that the whole party will be rededicated to all these very daunting but exciting challenges for China and for the whole nation. Right, and uh, Xi, Xi Jinping actually at least stressed a lot on uh, being people-centered. He stressed that concept quite a lot, actually. Uh, so he said, uh, guarding the results, what's at the center of uh, guarding the results of the arduous fight, arduous road that the Communist Party has gone through during the more than 100 years is to guard the hearts of the people. It's well said, but uh, exactly how? And how to guard the hearts of people, for instance, how this National Congress of the Communist Party relates to everybody in the country. Yeah, I, I think this uh, this is very significant, actually, because uh, you know this is actually a consensus building. This is more actually, uh, you know, we are a unified country, and I think there's a lot of uh, emphasis on the unity. So, President Xi actually talked about uh, 15 aspects, which is cover wide ranging of uh, the, the, the things, issues, challenges, and opportunities, and, and the grand objective we're facing. So, I think this is really an occasion to rally the country, to really stimulate the people, and, and unify it. Uh, the minds and the hearts of the people. So I think this is really a great message, but also send a very positive, open image and, and, and message to the world as well. So China is actually on the right track. And uh, I was very really impressed when, <laughs> when Xi Jinping mentioned about uh, China has built the largest education system, mm -hmm. largest uh, social security, uh, largest uh, you know, health system. That's mm -hmm. incredible. So, so I think there's so many things that uh, uh, we have, can learn from this uh, speech and we can really mm -hmm. find uh, uh, you know, uh, the ju objectives to, mm -hmm. to fight for. Uh, for the years to come. Now, yeah. having said that, let's uh, get more details uh, from uh, the report. At the opening session of the 20th CPC National Congress, Xi Jinping outlined the central task of the party. 
From this day forward, the central task of the Communist Party of China is to unite and lead the Chinese people of all ethnic groups in a concerted effort to realize the second centenary goal of building China into a great modern socialist country in all respects, and to advance the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts through a Chinese path to modernization. So, uh, Mr. Gaulio, we talked about the features. Now let's talk about the central task. And uh, it looks like there will be two steps for the near future. One, the first one is from the year 2020 to the year 2035, and the next one is from the year 2035 uh, to the middle of the century. Um, what, what do you make of the uh, the setting of the, these two steps and the ensuing um, strategies and policies? Well, indeed, by today, China has already completely and profoundly transformed itself, economically speaking. By now, China is already the second largest economy only after the United States by official exchange rate. And China ranks number one in a whole range of things, for example, for example, production of automobiles, iron and steel, you name it. However, China really need to put more substance to the economic development so that the 1.4 billion people can really get all benefits from the economic growth. Dong Ying mentioned uh, serving the people. I think to serve the people is really the fundamental drive for the CPC as a political force. And the people's desires keep changing. It's dynamic. It's not carved in stone. So I think CPC really need to understand what's the changing circumstances in China, what the people really want at this particular moment. For example, their economic growth has already enriched a lot of people in China, but that's not the end. They continue to desire more things, both economic as well as political, for example. And the CPC really can not be complacent. They re nearly really need to be on the inno innovative side. This is why this goal up to 2035 is very important because by then, according to Xi Jinping, China will have already achieved kind of comprehensive economic development, prosperous country, developed countries. And then by the middle of the century, China really will be, I think, one of the most important economies in the world and also one of the most developed countries in the world. And I think the whole Chinese people are really looking forward, not only to the coming five years, but all the way up to 2035 and then to 2049 or 2050, so that we will not be lost. We will have a very, very clearly defined goal going forward for ourselves, for our families, for our companies, institutions, but also for the whole Chinese nation. And all this is in the overall context of the global development because the Chinese economy really has a major impact on the rest of mankind. Very yeah. clear, very uh, high missions and goals along the way when we embark on the new journey. Uh, but what might be the challenges hidden somewhere? Well, challenges, for example, the demographic changes in China are rapidly uh, happening and we really need to pay a lot of attention because the lead time is very long. If we do not take actions promptly, for example, it may be too late. That's number one. Number two is that China graduated more than 10 million college graduates uh, uh, in June or July uh, last summer and these college graduates really look forward to get more meaningful jobs and right now there is a economic headwinds in China as well as in the rest of the world so how to mobilize all the resources in China to make sure that these aspiring college graduates will really find a good paying and meaningful first job upon getting out of college this is another challenge now the other thing is that China is faced with a lot of headwinds headwinds in its relations, especially with the United States. And most of the problems are on Washington's side rather than on our side. But how to really manage China-US relations in a constructive way, rather than to see the relations really get out of control, which will be detrimental not only to the Chinese interests, but also to the United States, for example. And how to make sure that peace prevails and war will never be a real option between China and the United States. That's the most important thing because without peace, any effort about economic or social development probably will be washed away. That's yes. why a stable mm. China is very important indeed. Now, Xi Jinping has uh, stressed the significance of a high quality development in the report. Let's take a listen. To build a modern socialist country in all respects, we must, first and foremost, 
pursue high-quality development. Development is our party's top priority in governing and rejuvenating China. For without solid material and technological foundations, we cannot hope to build a great modern socialist country in all respects. So, Mr. Wang, talking about high-quality development uh, in the near future, uh, the report mentions the importance of uh, continuing uh, this uh, supply-side structural reform. What could be the key tasks for this reform in the next few years to come? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know uh, what should be mentioned about from from high speed growth to high quality growth. That really the objective for for the next five to ten years actually the crucial for <laughs> realizing a modernized society. So, so I think you know uh, President Xi actually mentioned quite a few things there. You know, there's about uh, uh, you know uh, do circulation. That doesn't mean that we are not open. We have to actually have more openness on mm -hmm. that. Also, there's an emphasis of uh, a private sector. You know, also emphasis of uh, cooperation. Uh, and that was quite impressive that he's, he mentioned again that market have to p play a decisive role in the, mm -hmm. in the economy development and also of course the he emphasized also the the science and and technology and of course the talent he was saying that we need to attract the talents from all over the world actually you know talents the f most important resources uh, to really uh, revitalize the country so all those great messages i think that really uh, create a great uh, uh, impetus for china to continue to really, uh, you know, uh, those are all high quality related. That was about education. He was also mentioning young people. He, 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 there's many, many things that there's, uh, you know, so many messages being given that we have to really talk on that. So, so I think those are really key. I think the market play a decisive role and uh, we have to support private sector and of course also uh, utilize the SOE as, as well. So that's really very important. Uh, the, 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 including the multinationals, you know, we have the private sector, SOE, and, and multinationals that try uh, lateral uh, as a backbone for China to uh, going forward. It's a really great uh, emphasis. Indeed, let's get more from the report. Xi Jinping has called for advancing whole process people's democracy and ensuring that people run the country. Whole process people's democracy is the defining feature of socialist democracy. It is democracy in its broadest, most genuine, and most effective form. We must firmly stay on the path of socialist political advancement with Chinese characteristics, uphold the unity between party leadership, the running of the country by the people, and law-based governance, and ensure the principal position of the people, so as to give full expression to their will, protect their rights and interests, and spark their creativity. So, Mr. Gao, uh, what do you make of uh, the links or the relationship between democracy within the party and to this whole process, people's democracy? Well, I would say China is very dynamic and China is a democracy with China's own uh, characteristics. Uh, this is very contrary to the false accusations by some uh, people in the Western countries. Now, China's democracy with Chinese characteristics uh, are really composed of, first of all, intra-party democracy, that is within the CPC itself. After all, CPD is the ruling party with a membership of almost 100 million people. Now, the other is CPC with eight other democratic parties, as well as the All China Chamber of Commerce, which is composed of major and medium and smaller sized uh, Chinese uh, private enterprises, as well as a very large group of very distinguished outstanding people with no party affiliations. This is the Chinese democracy. It is not one party rule dictating everything to the rest of the society. It involves consultations, advisory things, and uh, solicitation of uh, opinions from other democratic parties. Many people in the West are shocked that China have other democratic parties altogether eight of them and then this group of people without affiliate political affiliation is also a very important meaning they are not particularly focused on party activities but then they think about china they are patriots they want to contribute to china's overall economic and political development and sometimes they can really come up with outstanding and excellent ideas and proposals because they are doctors, lawyers, accountants, scientists, educators of all kinds and also private artisans, painters for example, musicians. Right. So they are very focused in their own particular line of specialization and expertise and they want to pull their resources together to make sure that China moves in the right direction. 
Now, this is very different. I would say China finds its own political system best suited for China's own circumstances right now. And China does not want to impose whatever we have or however we do things onto any other countries. But equally, it is absolutely not acceptable for any other country to try to impose their ways or their political system onto China. Therefore, I hope the rest of the world will realize that what we have in China is a very dynamic process of democracy with our own characteristics suited to deal with the challenges and opportunities in China. Right. So, Mr. Wang, what do you make of the very term whole process? Well, this is very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually comprehensive. Basically, it means there's so many aspects. Of there's, there's, a, there's a basic, there's a grassroots democracy, village democracy. There's also consultative democracy. And also, uh, as uh, Victor mentioned, there's also a uh, uh, multi, <laughs> Uh, we have eight democratic parties, actually. So, and also now China emphasizes a lot of, uh, of think tanks. You have uh, universities, we have institute, research institutes. They are all generating a lot of, uh, cons you know, consultative ideas for the government to make a, a democratic decisions. And also we have a uh, meritocracy as well. <laughs> China has been, you know, selecting and electing for the officials. You have to, you know, go, you know, go through the grassroots training and, and up to the upper levels. All those really are very unique. China has a 5,000 years history, uninterrupted civilization. So that's really give a lot of uh, merits for the Chinese system. So I think that uh, we have to really use the talent. You know, China pays a huge uh, uh, attention on education, on the training, on the young people. So those really uh, give a bottom views of, uh, of a democratic process. So you can do well, and then you can excel, and then you can be noticed, and you can be selected, and you can be really put into the important position, like we have selected, uh, you know, 2,300 party delegates, you know, it's a really comprehensive process. So, so I think it's whole rounded on that, and it's really important that China is a unique system that really performs that that's created the second largest economy in the world in, in just a matter of decades. The system not only mm. consists of uh, the uh, complete set of institution right. or procedures, but also full participa participation and also uh, practices. Mm -hmm. Right, now let's get more from the report. Xi Jinping says China will strive to realize the reunification of the country and will never promise to renounce the use of force. We will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and the utmost effort. But we will never promise to renounce the use of force, and we reserve the option of taking all measures necessary. This is directed solely at interference by outside forces and the few separatists seeking Taiwan independence and their separatist activities. It is by no means targeted at our Taiwan compatriots. Right, the Taiwan question is, uh, has, been a, has gone through a very dramatic uh, uh, turbulence in recent, especially in this year. Uh, she said great sincerity and uh, utmost effort. How should we understand these two terms, Mr. Wang? Yeah, I think this has uh, been the policy has been uh, Chinese government has been upholding for, for, for decades. You know, China, would, of course, uh, would like to have a peaceful reunification and we wanted to owe efforts, uh, like uh, you know, Xi Jinping just said, we have to really do our utmost uh, to promote a peaceful reunification. Of course, but we were never going to uh, uh, abandon the, 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 the you know, other measures. If, mm. if this is really separatist, uh, there is a foreign influence or even the invasion. So territorial integrity and sovereignty is of uttermost of China. And that is a principal practice around the world. Even we can see that in the, in the in Ukraine Russian crisis now. So, so we have to stick to sovereignty and territorial integrity. And of course, that China promote peaceful reunification. That we already see millions of Chinese mainland, you know, travel to Taiwan, and then student exchanges and, and husband wives marriages happen. So I think the economic unification, you know, is is really uh, that we are promote, and also you know those great uh, uh, peaceful reunification efforts that have done by the government. Mm -hmm. But of course, <laughs> we always prevent for the worst scenario. Right. So it's not provoked by you know. Uh, you know, break the three communicate, for example, you know, a high level visit of officials, which is not, uh, uh, you know, that 181 countries established diplomatic ties with China as uh, based on this principle, there's only one China and there's no official ties. Mm -hmm. So we should really keep that uh, commitment and not really, uh, you know, disrupt the status quo. Mm -hmm. 
And all the options have uh, been clearly stated on the white paper on the Taiwan question, actually. And Mr. Gao, so to Ch the mainland actually want, wants to and hopes to solve the Taiwan question in a peaceful way, right? It, it needs a lot of wisdom. How do you assess the mainland's uh, efforts and also uh, the actions on that so far? Well, allow me to emphasize, uh, first of all, that when Xi Jinping uh, talked about the reunification of Taiwan, his remarks drew the longest and the loudest applauses from the delegates. This is very important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, everyone in the audience, it seems, and all of us outside of the Great Hall of the People are very much convinced that China will achieve national reunification mm -hmm. by whatever means, preferably by peaceful means. But if everything is exhausted and still there are separatist movements in Taiwan aided and abetted for, by foreign powers, of course China is fully justified to use whatever means other than peaceful means to achieve national reunification. Allow me to emphasize one thing. I think as far as the unification of Taiwan, China has the reasons, the history, the logics, and all the uh, resources uh, on our side. Because no one in the world can recognize both PRC, that is in China's mainland, as well as uh, the Republic of China at the same time. This is not possible because China does not allow any other country to recognize two countries on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and any attempt to promote Taiwan separatism or independence is doomed to failure. Mm. And there are countries which want to fabricate the situation or to hollow out the one China policy as if, for example, they have the power to create two Chinas, for right. example. And I hope these countries and these political forces will be convinced that whatever they do is doomed to failure. Why? Because the 1.4 billion plus Chinese people will never allow the separatism of Taiwan. Right, and this is the red line on, on, based on which that China and other countries uh, are mm. establishing their bilateral relations indeed. And this is the not line, red line that uh, nobody can, uh, can cross. Indeed. Now let's uh, take a look at the global picture. Xi Jinping has called for promoting world peace and development and building a human community with a shared future. China has always been committed to its foreign policy goals of upholding world peace and promoting common development. And it is dedicated to promote a human community with a shared future. China remains firm in pursuing an independent foreign policy of peace. It has always decided its position and policy on issues based on their own merits, and it has strived to uphold the basic norms governing international relations and to safeguard international fairness and justice. So, Mr. Wang, many are saying that the world is facing more and increasing uncertainty nowadays and not exactly optimistic about a near future for world peace. But from those words in the report, uh, what have you sensed about uh, China's uh, foreign policy facing a world of uncertainties? Yes, I think what uh, Xi Jinping has actually said uh, was, is a great assurance to the world. I mean, that is probably a, a great message was uh, being expected. China will continue to seek uh, peaceful and build a shared future for mankind. So China has this grand uh, uh, objective. Also, China has launched a uh, uh, global development initiative and global security initiative, basically contribute to the global public domain of, of, of you know, how can we have a you know, better narrative and better explanation and better uh, uh, objectives and the unity of the world. Uh, we are facing crises, we are facing climate changes, we are facing pandemic, we are facing all those challenges. And China being <laughs> second largest economy in the world and, and also very second largest uh, you know, donor to the United Nations, you know, trying to you know, protect the multilateralism, practice multilateralism, mm -hmm. provide public goods, as, as President Xi said, as a public good, a BI, you know, to the world. Right. It's uh, enormous. Mm -hmm. So this is really a great message to mm -hmm. hear. Right. And Mr. Gao, the world is, as what Mr. Wang said, entering a trop choppy waters indeed. Uh, uh, stability and peace are the common pursuit of everybody nowadays. And um, how important do you think is the leadership of a stable CPC to a big country like China? 
Yes, indeed. I listened very carefully to what Xi Jinping said about the international challenges. I would say, in the world of today, there are forces which agitate for war, and they agitate for war directly against other countries, or they agitate for surrogate wars, using other people in other countries to fight against another country. Now, this is very dangerous. I think, if unchecked, this will really lead to greater disasters for mankind as a whole. What China stands. For as outlined by Xi Jinping, is that China is a major force for peace.、Mm. China does not want to look at war as an instrument of policies or international relations, and China will not use war to invade or launch attack against any other country. Now, never before and will never. Absolutely, and China does not seek hegemony either in the past or in today, or for example,、uh, up to 2035 or up to the middle of this century when the Chinese economy will grow significantly larger as it、uh, compared with what's the situation today. That that is very important, as Henry said. China itself is a major force for peace. And will be a major force of opposing war of all kinds. And whenever there is a war, China promotes peace. China wants to have the parties involved directly or indirectly in that war to sit down at the negotiation table to solve whatever problems through diplomacy, rather than pouring more fuel onto the fire, or even, for example. Try to urge the people in that country to fight until the last person in that country. From the Chinese perspective, we really see all these as inconsequential. First of all, not constructive, and promoting peace is the best way because eventually you not only save the peoples involved, but also try to de-escalate the tension so that the. Uh, Holocaust or the、uh, catastrophes not only do not befall on those people, but they will not get out of control, which will really hurt the fundamental interest of mankind as a whole.、Mm-hmm. Mm. That's why China, instead of、uh, casting a lot of、uh, sanctions to other countries,、uh, China raised the Global Development Initiative and also Global Security Initiative.、Uh, those are the better ways to solve the problems in the world. Than sanctions, I think. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen, and、uh, that's it for our special coverage of the opening of the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. More than 2,000 delegates will continue their discussions in a series of meetings over the next seven days to draw a roadmap for China's development in the years to come. Indeed, much to anticipate. Stay tuned to CGTN for live updates for all those events. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Pan Dongyan, Beijing, and I'm Li Dongning. Bye for now. Stay tuned.